Good morning. My name is Sydney Watson, and I'm the director of the St. Louis University Center for Health Law Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to the 33, 33rd Annual Health Law Symposium. Uh, you can find the schedule online. Um, I'm welcoming you from St. Louis today. It is a beautiful almost spring day. The sun is shining. Many of you who are joining us today are regulars at this event. You are our friends and alums, and this is a time each year where we get to say hello and catch up uh, on lives and careers and trials and tribulations. And for those of you, normally we would be on the 12th floor of the law school. We'd be in the moot courtroom with lots of sunshine and a view of the arch and a view of Bush Stadium. So just imagine that now, close your eyes, think about it a minute, and think about that moot courtroom now reconfigured so that we can teach torts and contracts and health law in a way that's socially distanced and safe for everyone. It's been an unusual year, but it's also been a year where we've learned to do Zoom so that this year we're also able to welcome many, many new people to this event who have not been able to join us before. We have participants from the East Coast and the West Coast and audience members from Washington to Florida, and we welcome you too. And we also want to let you know that part of the learning that we've all had during this pandemic is how to use Zoom. And we look forward to being able to share the 34th annual symposium, both live and through Zoom, so we can have uh, an opportunity to learn from you and to share with all of you. During this year, as we've transitioned to online teaching and to using Zoom and to figure out how to interact with our students and each other in a very different way. I wanna share with you some of the wonderful work that our health law students have been doing. One of our traditions here at the Health Law Center is offering service learning courses courses for credit where our students learn to be lawyers of the future by serving the community. And that wonderful work has continued during this pandemic crisis. In Professor Bartlett's Human Rights at Home Litigation Clinic, our health law students are working with residents of a historically black low income community in East St. Louis to get them access to clean water and adequate sewer services. In Professor Yerby's Health Equity, Race, Health and Justice class, our students are working in partnership with the CDC to identify federal and state laws that protect against pregnancy discrimination and keep an eye out for the white paper they are going to be producing soon explaining their outcomes. In our grassroots advocacy class, our law students are working with Missouri Appleseed as part of a transdisciplinary research team that includes medical students and anthropologists on a project to understand how COVID is committed between communities, prisons, and jails to develop policies to better protect both inmates and the community. They're working in that project under the supervision of Dr. Fred Rodnick and Professor Chad Flanders. And in addition to these service learning classes, our faculty and our students continue with their teaching and service uh, to create a better public health and healthcare community, particularly in response to the pandemic and to create public policy to address future pandemics. Rob Gatter has been advising local officials on pandemic response. Professor Gatter and Dean Tom Burroughs of the College of Public Health and Social Justice offered an amicus brief in support of state and local public health agencies authority um, to craft public health orders during a pandemic. Professor Anna Santos Rushman, Rob Gatter and Dr. Tim Wemkin submitted comments to the National Academies of Health on the framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Santos Rushman has been advising the Biden administration on their vaccine policy. Professor Yerby testified to an HHS task force on inclusion of minorities in clinical trials. And Professor Yerby has co-founded this year the St. Louis University Center for Healing Justice and Health Equity to address structural racism in healthcare 
public health and beyond. And all of the faculty members at the Center of Health Law Studies are very honored to be affiliated members of that faculty as we move forward. And much, much work is going on. Professor Elizabeth Pendo, who has organized this program today, in addition to doing the work you are going to hear about today, has a project that it's first of its kind that has involved students with over 700 practicing physicians from multiple specialties and locations across the country to learn about their attitudes about patients and disabilities. The students are working to develop legal and policy recommendations to improve healthcare experiences and outcomes with people with disabilities based upon their findings, which are going to be published as a series of papers. Professor Pindo has also been speaking to medical associations, bioethics associations, uh, bar associations about the Americans with Disabilities Act and protections for people with disabilities, both as they relate to this pandemic and as we move forward and understand better the role of law. And finally, Dr. Heather Vignarek and I have been working with a team of law students and a team from Washington University on implementing Medicaid expansion in the state of Missouri, something that many of our law students have worked on uh, for years and years. And as this work goes on in DC, Mal Harkins continues to supervise and mentor our students who are working uh, throughout the government um, to craft federal law and through the, the world of remote working, we have been able to expand our placements beyond St. Louis and DC to include uh, additional placements in Chicago where Katie Koch is with Equip for Equality and Nina Patel is working for HHS's Office of Health Resources and Services Administration. It's been a great year. I can tell you much more about the writing awards our students have done, the work that the journal students who are helping to co-sponsor today's symposium are doing to finish a special issue on COVID-19, health equity and justice. Uh, but it's time to move on to uh, what we are here for today. And I wanna turn it over now to the next set of speakers to introduce you to today's topic and to what we will be spending the day doing. Welcome, welcome to St. Louis, welcome to Zoom, welcome to the 33rd Symposium on Health Law. Thank you. Uh, Bioethics Research Center at Washington University School of Medicine. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this symposium will present a, a project that we've done collaboratively with the SLU Health Law Pro Program. And this is a project that's been going for about 10 years. Um, it started with collaborations with alumna, Megan Vasher, Kelly Deneen, and now is continuing with Elizabeth Pendo, Professor Pendo. Uh, the project was inspired, sorry, in many ways by the fact that when the press published stories about ethical disasters, they often um, recommended more training. And, and I was deeply skeptical that more training was typically the answer to problems that, that really were criminal. Did, did training address the root causes? So we did a study to try to understand the motives, means, and opportunity behind these cases of really egregious wrongdoing in medicine. Um, we received five years of funding from the National Institutes of Health and uh, really found very quickly that physicians who engaged in egregious wrongdoing offended for a very long time. They tended to harm very many people before they were removed. And it seemed like a real opportunity for improvement here. And so this project that you're gonna hear about today is really the next step in that project. Um, it involves a collaboration again between our, our Bioethics Research Center and the Health Law Program at SLU, as well as the Federation of State Medical Boards, which we are so excited about. Um, the aim of the project is to help state medical boards deal with egregious wrongdoing much more effectively. So the first talk that we're going to hear uh, this morning is from Dr. Tristan McIntosh, and it will focus on the project itself, 
which generated consensus recommendations. And then the second talk is by Professor Elizabeth Pendo, and it will explore consensus recommendations that provide fodder for statutory action. So Dr. Tristan McIntosh is a faculty member at the Bioethics Research Center at Washington University School of Medicine. She earned her PhD in industrial organizational psychology from the University of Oklahoma, where she focused on ethics, innovation, and leadership. And she applies a lot of this in the, in the context of research. So she focuses on ethics, ethical culture in the research workplace, effective lab and management practices. Um, and now ethical issues that are emerging with the development and implementation of neurotechnologies by clinicians. She's serving as the lead investigator on this project, which was funded by the Greenwall Foundation. The second talk is by Professor Elizabeth Pendo, who's the Joseph Simeon Professor of Law at St. Louis University School of Law and a member of the Center for Health Law Studies and the William C. Waifel Center for Employment Law. Her legal and health policy research focuses on the impact of state and federal laws on healthcare experiences and outcomes of vulnerable patients, especially people with disabilities and chronic illnesses. She's published over 40 law review articles, books, and other publications on disability law and theory health law policy and bioethics. She also has extensive experience working with interview data and, and mapping state, and, um, uh, state laws. And this has been a crucial element of our current project. Uh, she also co-authored a report on the role of law and policy in achieving specific disability and health goals for healthy people 2020, the law and health policy project a partnership between Health and Human Services, the CDC, which was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So um, really excited about this program. I think we have wonderful things to share and I will turn it over now to Dr. Tristan McIntosh. Thank you very much. Just give me a quick second to get my slides up and running. All right, so hopefully you can all see my slides. Let me know if there are any issues. Um, but thank you, Jim, for that great introduction. I'm really excited to talk with all of you today about our project. It's sort of the culmination of this project that's identified recommendations state medical boards can use and adopt to better protect patients from egregious wrongdoing. But quickly before I dive in, I do wanna give a shout out and thank you to the Greenwall Foundation who's funded this project and our awesome research team and re staff and project advisory board who have done an awesome job in helping this project go smoothly. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'll be talking about, my talk is kind of broken up into three different parts. So first I'll talk about the salience of egregious wrongdoing in medicine and our team's past research on the topic. And then spend the remaining two thirds of the talk talking about our consensus panel overview and highlight some of the top recommendations that came out of those um, consensus uh, panel recommendations. So the thing that makes this particular situation unique is that physicians are not quite like other professionals. It's common and necessary for them to engage patients in ways that are oftentimes invasive and intimate such as cutting them open to perform surgeries or giving powerful drugs or asking patients to undress and touch them in intimate ways. And given the nature of these interactions, special oversight is needed by physicians to make sure that patients are being adequately protected and not being taken advantage of by harmful physicians. And for this project, we exclusively focused on egregious wrongdoing by physicians. So when we talk about egregious wrongdoing, we're talking about things like sexually abusing patients, performing unnecessary invasive procedures and prescribing controlled substances in a way that's not appropriate. So we're not focused on more minor non-compliance issues. We're really talking about the bad apples of medicine. And these egregious behaviors are among the most common causes of major disciplinary actions by state medical boards, which are the regulatory body that licenses physicians and investigates complaints and disciplines those who violate the Medical Practice Act. So not only are these 
you know, behaviors of egregious wrongdoing, doing felony crimes, but they're behaviors that undermine public trust in the profession of medicine and also results in direct harm to patients. Uh, this one we're, we're uh, turning around. Are we doing that? And so the question becomes how common is egregious wrongdoing? And the answer to that is probably more common than it should be. So only a minority of physicians commit egregious violations. So about five out of a thousand are subject to severe state are subject to disciplinary action by state medical boards annually. But the rate of severe disciplinary action is very similar to the annual rate of, for example, new breast cancer diagnoses per year, and is much larger than the rate of new HIV cases per year. Just to give you some perspective as to this, uh, the frequency of these issues. And what's interesting about these stats is that they reflect only those instances of wrongdoing that are reported and that we know about. So the number of actual serious ethical violations is unknown and it's likely that those instances are underreported. So given the unknown number of actual serious ethical violations and the severity of harm that they cause, it's an urgent public health concern that needs to be addressed at a structural and policy level. And this is also problematic because egregious violations by physicians are seldom reported to state medical boards. And low reporting to boards can be due for a number of reasons. So patients may just lack the knowledge about the existence of state medical boards and their function. And they may also try to report instances to hospital administration that might try to keep it in-house to avoid bad press and sort of finding workarounds, especially for those uh, physicians who are high performers who bring in a lot of revenue. And to complicate matters further, there's six-fold variation by state in severe disciplinary actions taken by state medical boards. And that is, you know, some boards fail to take action against a physician's license and others do. And this variety can be due to many reasons. So oftentimes there are limitations imposed by state legislation and resources available to state medical boards for investigating physicians. Uh, there's some ambiguity about what actually constitutes a serious ethical violation. There are concerns of over scrutinization. So oftentimes people who are on state medical boards are physicians and there's concerns about over scrutinizing their peers. And another issue might be there, there are shortages of physicians in rural areas. So a board might be reluctant to revoke a physician's license in an area where there aren't as many physicians there to treat that portion of the population. So in light of these circumstances, as Jim alluded to in his opening talk, um, he examined cases, 280 cases of egregious wrongdoing in medicine, identified the major types of them and their causes. And part of this project involved convening a working group of experts to make recommendations about how to prevent egregious wrongdoing in medicine. And part of this recommendation includes establishing more uniform and transparent actions by state medical boards, which is exactly what this project sought to do. And part of this included the idea that we'd involve the Federation of State Medical Boards to support these practices and share them among state medical boards. And we would also publish examples of effective model statutes that could facilitate adoption of these best practices. So what we really did is sought practical solutions for addressing this problem of the variability in state medical board responses to egregious wrongdoing by physicians. So how did we do it? Uh, we did something used to be called a modified Delphi consensus panel, which is really just a fancy way of saying that we convened a group of experts. And in this case, our experts were state medical board members and executive staff. We convened them together to generate and evaluate solutions to this problem and come to a consensus as to which of these proposed solutions are the most important for addressing this problem. So we asked panelists to identify particularly effective or innovative practices resources and provisions that boards need to encourage enable and to encourage and enable reporting of egregious wrongdoing to investigate accused physicians uh, to discipline physicians better and to deter them from engaging in egregious wrongdoing in the first place but also to protect and empower patients and also increase transparency in this process altogether so we really sought game changers that other state medical boards could adopt and so to do this, we administered multiple online surveys or questionnaires to our panelists with the purpose of identifying recommendations that were agreed upon by the majority of our panelists. And it was especially important to us that we worked with members of state medical boards and their staff to seek solutions because that can help cultivate buy-in when we you know, put forward these recommendations, they would be um, on board for adopting them. And so what this whole process did, it was uh, yielding a list of recommendations, both legal and non-legal recommendations that can be used as a guide for boards 
who wish to improve their practices. And we had a fantastic lineup of panelists. So our project advisory board provided recommendations of people who would provide thoughtful insight and recommendations and be active participants in this process. And our goal was to recruit about 40 panelists that represented about 50% of the state medical boards that served the US and its territories. And we had originally recruited 40, but two folks had to drop out for personal reasons. And we ended up with 38 panelists who participated in all four surveys. And we also had a good variety of state medical board roles included. So the majority of people on our panel uh, were physicians, but we also had good representation from executive members, legal counsel, and public members of state medical boards. And before participating in these surveys, we held an orientation webinar to give them an overview of our process and sort of share stories and background information to illustrate the project significance. We also answered any questions and concerns our panelists had and shared the prompts with them that they would be asked in the surveys so that they could understand what was being asked of them and so they could begin to critically think about what responses they would want to share in those surveys. And it also gave them time to go back and consult with their fellow state medical board members to come up with recommendations to share for this project. I'm gonna walk you through the four different surveys that we asked panelists to complete. So in this first round, we sent an open-ended survey and asked participants or panelists to describe particularly innovative or effective practices, resources, or legal provisions that their board currently has, or those that their board currently lacks, but they felt is urgently needed. And after that, we received about 500 different open-ended responses and our team went through and consolidated many of them because of redundancies and then put a nice little list together that would be moved on to that second round survey. So in round two, for each individual recommendation, panelists were asked to do two things. So one of them was to indicate whether or not their state medical board had already adopted that recommendation. And then second, they were asked to rate the importance of each recommendation and they rated on a scale of one to nine. So one being not at all important, nine being extremely important. And for those recommendations that reached consensus, they did not move on to subsequent rounds. So it went 75% or more of the panelists agreed that the recommendation was important. Then we had sort of stopped it there at that point and that had considered to reach consensus. Now in round three, we presented those no consensus items and the percentage of panelists who rated each recommendation as low, medium, or high. And then we asked panelists to re-rate and provide a rationale for those no consensus recommendations. And we also asked them to describe barriers to implementing some of those low adoption recommendations to identify and provide a little bit of contextual information. And then this fourth and final round, again, we only presented those recommendations that received uh, no consensus in the subsequent rounds. And we presented panelists with the rationales of their peers for low, medium, and high importance ratings. And we asked our panelists to really take time and consider the perspectives of their fellow peers who were on the panel, and then finally provide a, a final rating of importance. And what this did was yield a list of 63 different recommendations. Uh, 51 of those had reached strong consensus. So 75% or more of our panelists agreed, yes, these 51 recommendations are super important to addressing matters of egregious wrongdoing and variability in state medical board practices. Five of those recommendations were moderate, so they didn't quite reach that threshold of 75%, but still a good size consensus of the group had agreed that those recommendations were important. And then seven of them had reached weak consensus. And so we, we didn't pursue those uh, quite as much as those who that reached strong and moderate consensus. And so our research team clustered those 56 recommendations that reach strong and moderate consensus into these five different categories. And in just a minute, I'll go through specific recommendations, but I wanted to give you an overview really quickly um, about those five different clusters so you can get an idea of the types of recommendations that we, um, we got from panelists. So the first one is dealing with board website outreach and education, so sort of having an improved public interface and improving the board websites about its purpose and um, what it does. The second recommendation had to do with internal board operations and investigations. So think of the behind the scenes stuff that you know board staff work on to, to go about investigating physicians accused of egregious wrongdoing. 
And then this third cluster is improved coordination and information sharing between stakeholders. So oftentimes there are different entities that play a role in this process of investigating wrongdoing. So sort of think of groups like law enforcement or the VA or medical schools. And you know, having that increased information transparency and sharing allows for greater mobilization of these groups efforts and also improves efficiency in investigating uh, wrongdoing. And then this fourth cluster of licensing and disciplinary considerations, you can think of this as things like matters of you know, mandatory reporting and emergency suspensions. And then this fifth and final cluster had to do with board composition or the makeup of the board. So I wanna quickly orient you to this first cluster of recommendations of board composition and characteristics and to this table really quickly. So you'll see on the left-hand column there, that's the actual recommendation itself. And then the second column indicates the percentage of panelists who rated that recommendation as highly important. So you can see these were all rated uh, very highly important by all of our panelists. And in that third column there, you can see at what round of consensus that particular recommendation was reached. So you can see in this case, all of them had reached consensus at round two where all of our panelists had agreed right off the bat, these are all important to addressing uh, the problems posed for the panel. And this fourth column here is the percentage of panelists who had reported adopting that recommendation already. And one other thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is those items in bold. So those are recommendations that our team felt were likely to have the great magnitude of impact because there's agreement about the recommendations importance, but fewer state medical boards have already adopted those recommendations. So just to highlight a few specific ones. So if you look at recommendations one and three here, they really get at the idea that boards need adequate staffing and resources, both from just a general administrative standpoint, but also for conducting thorough investigations. So if boards are understaffed, they're not gonna be able to do these things well and in a timely manner. And if you look at recommendations two, four, and six, they get at this idea that the board needs to have adequate racial and gender diversity, especially for teams investigating cases of sexual misconduct. So if you think about the type of people that are most likely to be you know, targeted for egregious wrongdoing, it's oftentimes women and people of color. And so it's good to have those groups represented in these different board processes and investigations. Moving on to the second cluster of internal board operations and investigations, just to highlight a few. So the second recommendation suggests creating a screening committee to help prioritize complaints that require urgent action and investigation. And sort of relatedly, recommendation three is identifying what type of misconduct triggers those special procedures like an emergency suspension of a physician's license to prevent further harm to patients. And then I'm going to quickly highlight this fourth recommendation here. So it didn't quite reach that threshold of 75% or more, but we thought it was still important. So the NPDB is the National Practitioners Data Bank, which is an online repository of reports about physician wrongdoing. Um, and when state medical boards report incidents to the NPDB, there's an option to report using sort of a nondescript other or NA category. And this is not helpful, right? Because it doesn't provide details about the wrongdoing being done and it can result in an underplaying of wrongdoing in a certain way. And so by being more explicit and transparent about the nature of the wrongdoing, that can help improve transparency about the process and the nature of the wrongdoing itself. And for this third cluster of improved coordination and information sharing between stakeholders, I wanna highlight recommendations one and three. Um, so think about you know, medical schools and residency programs reporting egregious wrongdoing and disciplinary complaints as a condition to licensure eligibility. So as the saying goes, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So knowing about past bad behavior of trainee physicians, that can help state medical boards be proactive in identifying red flags. And this fourth recommendation here I wanted to highlight is having better information sharing across boards. It would help the boards be a little less siloed and this would prevent a physician who is being investigated for wrongdoing in one state to just hop over to another state and continue practicing medicine without the knowledge of that other state's medical board. So if boards are more transparent in the information they share, um, they can more proactively curb egregious behavior. 
And then this fourth cluster of licensing and disciplinary considerations. So this first recommendation gets at the idea of just raising certain acts to a felony level and the subject them to mandatory reporting to state medical boards. Uh, for this fourth recommendation with peers reporting peers. So peers are more likely to witness or have knowledge of their colleagues wrongdoing and have a duty to report if they know that a peer's behavior is negatively affecting patients' well-being. So that if it's found that peer physicians know about wrongdoing of a physician found to have actually engaged in the wrongdoing, the peer physicians would be penalized. And then just briefly for that fifth recommendation, it advocates for a lower burden of proof and disciplinary proceedings. Uh, when physicians are sort of being investigated for egregious wrongdoing. And for this fifth and final cluster of, you know, the board website outreach and education, I won't highlight specific recommendations per se, but you can tell that many of these get at the idea that board websites need to have good usability and accessibility, especially for patients to see the website, to be able to file complaints, access information about physicians who have been disciplined, and also better understand what behaviors are reportable to state medical boards. And along with this, many recommendations highlight the need for boards to better market themselves to the public so that the public knows that boards exist and what they do to really raise awareness about their functionality. So to sort of wrap things up, hopefully it's clear that by the example recommendations that we were able to identify several practical and actionable solutions for addressing the issue of variability in the way that boards address egregious wrongdoing in medicine. And we hope that boards will adopt at least some of these recommendations to better protect patients from harmful physicians and support more transparent actions and processes by boards. Uh, for next steps for our projects, we plan to convert recommendations to an inventory checklist with brief explanations that boards can use to self-assess their practices and identify areas for improvement. And we also plan to develop select model provisions with some explanations that can be used uh, to review and revise existing state statutes that govern board policies and practices. So that about does it for me. Um, thanks again for all of you for showing up and I'm going to turn things over to Elizabeth who's going to talk about a subset of those legal recommendations in more detail. Thank you. Thank you Tristan for laying out um, all the purpose and the methodology and the findings um, of the project. And as Tristan said, the findings from the expert panel were very rich. We have a lot to work with there. And they really point to a mix of practices, uh, need for resources, and also legal provisions uh, that state boards say they need in order to better protect the public. And we are going to address the different types of recommendations in a series of papers, but a subset of those recommendations could be um, could be adopted as a voluntary policy or practice. Others require or could benefit from state level legal action. So today's event centers on that subset. Um, and what I want to do today is present the five recommendations that we have selected for legal analysis. I'll give you an overview of the legal framework, our legal methodology, and then give you an example. So here are the five provisions that we selected for statutory analysis. And you can see they follow the categories that Tristan laid out. Uh, they address board composition and function, that's one and two. Uh, three and four really go to that theme of information sharing, right? If information is not flowing to the state medical boards, they can't take action on it. And then number five relates to the adjudication framework. And the paper that will come out of this symposium is going to offer model statutory language for each of these five with commentary. So I want to share our progress toward that goal with you. So first, the legal framework. Uh, there are about 70 state medical boards across the country. Um, there's at least one in every state, the District of Columbia, and also in US territories. And as Tristan said, state medical boards are tasked with protecting the public. And they do that by ensuring that physicians are competent and also that they uh, adhere to appropriate standards of care and ethical guidelines. Uh, despite the key role that state medical boards play in licensing and discipline and protecting the public, they've really received very little attention um, from academics and in the legal literature. And many of you are experts in this area, but for those of you who are not, I'll give you a brief overview of the legal framework. 
Um, first, the sources of law that we looked at, um, similar to other administrative bodies, state medical boards are governed by procedures and standards that are set by state enabling laws, typically called medical practice acts. Uh, they're also governed by state administrative laws and in some cases relevant judicial decisions. So those were the sources of law that we looked to to develop these model provisions and commentary. Uh, state enabling acts and other state laws also um, govern many different aspects of the board. For example, the size and the composition of state boards. State boards uh, range quite a bit in size from as large as 21 in Connecticut or Washington to as small as five in Vermont and New Mexico. Board members are typically volunteer physicians and members of the public who are um, in most cases appointed by the governor of the state. They can often be nominated or suggested by current board members or state medical organizations. Uh, composition requirements can include the size of the board, the mix of medical specialties, uh, the number of public members, geographic diversity, and other sorts of requirements. The state laws also authorize boards to engage in their core functions, right, to issue licenses for the practice of medicine, and to investigate complaints and to discipline physicians who engage in professional misconduct. And in almost all states, boards can also um, formulate and adopt policies and rules and regulations that relate to medical practice. And law also plays a role in the theme that Tristan mentioned of information sharing. The law plays a role in ensuring that the board receives the information that it needs. For example, discipline is largely a complaint driven process and the majority of complaints are made by patients um, and their families. But boards also receive information from other boards, from hospitals and healthcare organizations, from law enforcement, from other government agencies, um, et cetera. And law can require that type of reporting, right? States commonly impose duties to report on certain actors, but we know that underreporting remains a serious problem. And later today, Professor Chiarello is gonna shed light on the behavior of organizations that could impact decisions to report and how reporting happens. We also know that over-reliance um, on public reporting is a problem. And that's due in fact to lack of awareness about state medical boards. Um, as Tristan mentioned, the number of serious ethical violations is unknown. But here's some information from a 2018 survey done by Harris Poll that was commissioned by the Federation of State Medical Boards. Um, first, it found that more than half, like 51% of Americans did not know that state medical boards are responsible for physician licensing and discipline. Of the group that was surveyed, um, nearly one in five or 18% reported an interaction with a physician who they believed was acting unethically, unprofessionally, or providing substandard care. Of that 18%, only one in three reported that uh, interaction at all, right, to any entity or person. And of those that reported, only one in three of those notified the state medical board. So you can see that there is a serious underreporting problem combined with the lack of awareness problem, which means that information is not flowing to the state medical board. And prior studies have made some similar findings. In terms of the disciplinary process, this is where boards spend the majority of their time and resources. This will look quite familiar to lawyers uh, in the audience. And although there's some variation among state medical boards and laws, this is really an overview of the steps in the disciplinary process. The Federation of State Medical Board has excellent resources at their website if you want more detail on this. But essentially a complaint comes in, um, they're screened, to see if it falls within the board's jurisdiction. Grounds for physician discipline are defined by state law. They generally include failure to meet acceptable standards of care, sexual misconduct, improper prescribing, felony convictions, right? The egregious wrongdoing that we're focused on would be considered a violation um, in every state. So if the complaint is within the board's purview, uh, it can be prioritized for investigation. The board will uh, request documents and talk to witnesses. 
uh, consistent with due process guarantees, the physician is also notified. In some cases, there could be medical review um, of the file by a qualified expert. Uh, at that point, it can be dismissed if unfounded. It could be resolved privately, for example, through a letter to the physician. Those often aren't public. But if the board decides to take public action, generally the next step is moving to adjudication. That could either be a settlement um, or a hearing. At the hearing, um, evidence and witnesses are presented. There's additional due process requirements, right? A guarantee of an impartial decision maker, the right to present evidence and question witnesses. If it's not settled at any point during that process, it goes to adjudication. And if the board finds that a violation has occurred, um, that becomes part of the physician's public record. Um, physicians also have the right to appeal a negative decision by the board. Sometimes there's a requirement that um, administrative remedies be exhausted. For example, in California, a physician has 30 days to ask for reconsideration. But assuming that's all done, a physician can appeal it in state court. And the state court reviews the final decision of the board under a deferential standard of review. That's typical for administrative decisions. Right. In other words, they'll uphold the decision unless the court finds that it's not supported by substantial evidence. OK, so uh, against that backdrop, we wanted to offer model language and commentary that fits within uh, that existing legal framework for states. And the model provisions and commentary are intended to be a new resource um, for state medical boards, for state legislatures, for policymakers. Uh, to encourage and support examination of existing medical practice acts. And what we're doing is bringing together the elements that you see listed here, the expert informed findings of the project, the results of our legal mapping um, and legal and policy analysis, which ultimately is gonna include um, the expert insights of today's speakers as well. So to give you an example um, of what this might look like, here is an ex some example model language um, that addresses the first two of the five provisions. And this is a working draft that can be adapted in different ways, um, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, it's, it, it reflects existing approaches to a range of demographic factors, uh, to qualifying language, and reference to the demographic composition of the state. It also is in keeping with existing laws in nearly every state that govern other aspects of board composition, right? Um, size, geographic diversity, diversity of medical specialty, requirement of a public member. So how we reached this were state laws relevant to each of the five items were collected and coded using uh, legal surveillance standards. And this process was supported by an excellent team of law students, Jesse Becker, Darian Diepholz, Julia McFarland, and Maddie Quass. And it involved a complete survey of state laws in place uh, that were applicable to state medical boards that addressed each of the items. We're still uh, completing some of the coding process for some of the provisions, but I can show you some of our preliminary results. So here, for example, is the legal mapping results for those first two provisions on diversity. And the map on the left shows the eight states that have statutory language that applies to boards that addresses in some way gender diversity. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, the other map shows also shows eight states, but slightly different eight states that have statutory uh, provisions that address racial and ethnic diversity. Um, in state medical boards, right? And six of the states uh, combine references to different kinds of diversity, gender, race, and ethnicity, and also other characteristics, right? The most common other characteristics were age um, and a few had culture um, into a single provision. So our model language takes that approach rather than having separate provisions, we combine it into one. Uh, this would allow a state with no such requirements to consider adopting that language or a state that had some but not all requirements to amend their language. Uh, but of course, not all states address them together. 
North Dakota and Iowa address gender, but not race or ethnicity. And Oregon and Louisiana actually do the opposite. So there's some variations um, when we looked closely at these state laws. And, and one of the key variations was the intended outcome of the law, right? Three states uh, sought composition of board membership that reflects the composition of the state population. Um, North Dakota looked for composition that reflects the population eligible to serve. So for the physician members, that would be licensed physicians. For the public members, that would be the general public. Um, and Tennessee requires, to the extent feasible, the appointment of at least one woman and at least one person who is African American. So they take different approaches to the outcome that they're trying to achieve. And we, our model language called for membership that reasonably reflects the diversity of the state population. The difference between those first two approaches really points to the fact that um, given the well-documented lack of diversity in medicine, the demographics of the general population might be different and more diverse than the demographics of licensed physicians. Uh, but based on some surveys of licensed physicians, the diversity requirements uh, reflected in the model language are feasible. And we also used qualifying language to the extent possible or reasonably reflect. Um, there's also some different, there's also a few states that do not frame it in terms of outcome, but instead impose some requirements to the process. Right, you see uh, Missouri requires affirmative steps to appoint minority groups. Uh, Kansas requires, or Arkansas requires consideration um, of recommendations. And Louisiana does something that's a little bit in between, right? At least every other member that's appointed from a series of lists from minority health organizations must be a minority appointee. So all of these impose some requirements on the process, but they don't actually measure it in terms of outcome of the composition of the entire board. So after looking at the approach of existing states through that legal mapping process to see what we can learn um, about different approaches, we looked at the literature um, around the issue. And there are really many reasons why boards might want to support increased gender, racial and ethnic, and other types of diversity in state board membership, right? Equality of opportunity and representation issues being chief among them. But in keeping with the theme of this project, we're really focusing on the impact of diversity uh, on the board's ability to address egregious wrongdoing by physicians. So first of all, the, these were rated as highly important by our expert panel, and that was echoed by, by our advisory committee um, as well. I think diverse representation on boards, um, there's also professional organizations and experts have called for diversity in state board membership to improve board function. Right. In May 2020, the FSMB adopted a new report and recommendation uh, from the work group on physician sexual misconduct that addresses diversity in terms of board function. Right. In a section entitled Implicit Bias, the report states that di diverse representation on state medical boards in terms of gender, age, and ethnicity is important for ensuring balanced discussion and decisions. And we are very lucky to have Dr. Pat King with us today. Dr. King led that work group and is, will be speaking in the next session. And I've also learned from the work of uh, two other speakers, Professor Kelly Deneen and Jenna Leva, about different types of bias that often frame cultural beliefs about wrongful prescribing. So diversity and the ability to acknowledge and address implicit bias is key. And the positive impact of diversity on the function of groups is also supported by research in other fields. You see in that third bullet point, I've pulled a couple of specifics from different studies that were summarized in a Harvard Business Review article, why diverse teams are smarter. 
And a growing number of studies have also linked gender diverse boards, um, corporate boards in particular with better group decision making and governance. And we're gonna hear more about that um, from professors Lissa Broom and John Conley later today who are experts in that area. And I think uh, attention should also be paid to the intersection of different types of diversity in state medical board membership. Uh, for example, in Neely's 2019 article in that last bullet point, beyond the numbers, substantive gender diversity in boardrooms, um, on corp diversity in corporate governance, right? That really suggests that more attention needs to be paid to substantive gender diversity, meaning an opportunity to make a real impact rather than simply minimum representation. And how that might be relevant for state medical boards is most states require that boards include one or more public members. Um, however, the public members on the boards have really a wide range of authority and influence. Some may not be voting members or may not play a robust role in disciplinary functions. So that suggests that if individuals are appointed as public members and also serve as the members that meet the diversity requirements, then the benefits of diversity for group function may not be met. So in closing, I will say that our model provisions and commentary, um, as well as the other papers that Tristan mentioned are truly works in progress at this point. We are really grateful for the chance to share our work today and to benefit from the wisdom of the speakers and from everyone else here today. And we are looking forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions in chat. Uh, one of the first ones we received uh, started with some questions about the prior study of 280 cases. And I sent through the chat um, a list of the key references to articles from that study. I think that's the best way to answer that question. But it continued and said, I wonder if we should consider having some sort of mental fitness or character fitness to practice medicine and I definitely think the practices during medical school should be reviewed prior to licensure. What are your thoughts on this? Elizabeth, did you want to start or do you want me to take this? I need to think about it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, other um, boards that license other professions in many states actually do have a character and fitness examination. For example, that's required um, for a license to practice law. And there it's, you know, a criminal background check and other kinds of questions about conduct during law school. Um, I think the question about behavior during medical school is really an important one because there were actually at least two, possibly three recommendations that really went to this issue of boards may need to know um, about serious misconduct in medical school. The reason we didn't select that for a statutory analysis though, is that's a really good example of a type of recommendation that could be better implemented through a mechanism other than a state statute. For example, a board could simply require applicants to report any misconduct um, during medical school and to sign a waiver allowing the board to verify that information with the medical school, right? That would be a way to obtain that information. And that is in fact how it's done um, for licensing of lawyers. Tristan, do you have something you wanna add? No, I think that that definitely does it. Yeah, and just considering, you know, non-legal approaches to addressing some of these recommendations I think is another way to go about um, doing it. So yeah, I agree. So another question we received is, are, are there any cultural factors identified that lead people to not reporting uh, something other than, you know, lack of knowledge about the role of state medical boards? What are your thoughts on that? One thing that came to mind for me, I was just checking out this question on chat. 
I think many patients don't know what behaviors are considered bad or reportable. So they don't know about, you know, how ungloved examinations are a bad thing and they don't know to go about reporting that. So I think it's just a lack of education about certain behaviors that aren't, um, aren't good by physicians. I think that's part of uh, a cultural problem there. It's just an education issue. Elizabeth, did you have other thoughts? Yeah, I, there's a lot of literature as to why patients don't sue doctors um, for uh, breaches of standard of care, which is not exactly the same thing, but I think some of those insights are really relevant here. Um, patients can be really concerned about disrupting a relationship that they rely on for care. They may not feel that they have a lot of other alternatives for care um, if they disrupt that relationship. Um, as Tristan mentioned, they may not, sometimes it's very clear from a patient perspective um, when they might think an ethical violation has occurred, but in other cases, it may not be apparent to the patient. So there's a knowledge issue, then there's an awareness issue of where might you report. Um, and then there's also what, how will your care or relationships be disrupted if you report? And of course, if we're talking about sexual violations, then all of the literature on why primarily women um, are hesitant to report um, sexual violations also comes into play. All right, thank you. Uh, another question that a couple of people have posed is the question of representation from the LGBTQ community on boards, particularly considering that um, members of the LGBTQ community may be targeted more frequently for abuse. That's a really good insight and I'm glad that question was asked. Uh, the way the language is phrased, states can add other categories that they like to. Um, for example, a couple of states have cultural diversity specifically listed at least one has language diversity listed. So it's absolutely worth considering um, LGBT representation on boards as well. So thank you for that question. Super. So another re really a comment that's probably worthy of, of discussion um, says, there's a question about the definition of egregious behavior regarding prescribing. Improper prescribing covers a very big universe, most not involving what would ordinarily be considered egregious and um, controversies over proper prescribing are serious. Um, I would, would add that, you know, it's also very controversial to uh, define what are improper invasive procedures, surgeries and, and things like that. Uh, be, because I was leading the study of um, the cases of egregious wrongdoing, I might just comment on that. Um, the cases that we investigated were all uh, prosecuted and some of them, I would say, the vast majority were quite clear. You know, if you're talking about uh, trading drugs for sex or offering a prescription to someone so that you can trade it for your preferred um, substance or leaving signed prescription pads, you know, for someone at your front desk to give to patients, you know, for a fee. I, I think those are all obviously criminal type behaviors. But that said, you know, there certainly were cases in the data set where they were successfully prosecuted, but it was also controversial. And certainly when we published the um, paper on invasive procedures, um, the, the editor, you know, really forced us to address that much more, that, that the boundaries of the standard of practice are sometimes gray. So I would say this is intrinsic to this whole exercise, you know, um, trying to define the boundaries of proper practice. And, you know, I'll, I'll throw that out there for discussion. How should we tackle the challenge of um, standard of care as we prosecute or take action against egregious wrongdoing cases. This is 
actually a perfect lead in to what will be our um, next panel. Uh, Professor Kelly Deneen is an expert in the legal regulation of prescribing practice, is going to share some of her wisdom and insights about what type of prescribing um, misconduct or what type of prescribing practices should we be most concerned about in terms of patient harm and which really um, we should be less concerned about. Um, also, Dr. Pat King, who led the working group on the new FSMB policy on physician sexual misconduct, um, it's posted at their website and published in their journal, if you want to take a look at that, really sets up like the range, the spectrum um, of behaviors. And it is true for this project that we're looking at the behaviors that most clearly um, harm patients. But it's absolutely worth thinking about the examples in our category differently. For example, an unnecessary surgery clearly implicates questions about the standard of care. Some prescribing um, offenses or irregularities also involve questions about the standard of care. Sexual misconduct or sexual assault of a patient is much less likely to involve a standard of care question, although we could imagine a situation where it might. So I think it is worth thinking through the different examples because they're different from each other. And our very next panel is really gonna focus on that question of what is egregious misconduct, right? And what are we talking about when we talk about that as a category? Thank you, that's a, a great answer and I look forward to the next session. Amy, do you think we have time for one more question or, or should we wrap it up? I wanna be mindful of time. It looks like we have only one minute left. I think you can do one quick question. All right, so um, related to this, this last question, I think again, as a segue to what we're about to hear, uh, any, any thoughts, this is the question, on whether pharmaceutical or device companies or their staff should have a duty to report illegal or inappropriate prescribing or other problematic and egregious behaviors, they do not now. I think it would be a good idea personally. I don't know if Elizabeth, if you have additional thoughts on this, but yeah, they, they have firsthand knowledge about that type of behavior and sort of having that transparency, I think would help curb some uh, abuse or egregious wrongdoing. What do you think? Yeah, as long as state statutes that impose a duty to report are very clear on what those entities are required to report. And I think a preview of our entire paper, almost every state already has a duty to report on the part of other licensees. So physicians need to report um, the conduct of other physicians and also on hospitals and healthcare entities. But we know that there's a serious, serious underreporting problem. So while I think that imposition of a legal duty is extremely important, we also need to look at the reasons why reporting isn't happening and think about ways to encourage and enforce any requirements to report that we might impose. Okay, well, thank you so much. I will turn it back over to the program facilitators and I believe we're heading into a brief break before the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back. This is our second panel of the day. Um, and we have two wonderful panelists who are going to address defining egregious misconduct. Uh, first up will be uh, Dr. Patricia King, followed by uh, Dr. Kelly Deneen. And I have a brief introduction for each of them. So let me start there. Uh, well, Dr. <clears throat> King uh, is a past chair of the Federation of State Medical Board's Board of Directors and is a board member of the FSMB Foundation. She was a member of the Vermont Board of Medical Practice from 2003 to 2015, serving as its chair from 2010 to 2014. Dr. King was the chair of FSMB's work group on physician sexual misconduct and chair of FSMB's work group on education about medical regulation for students and residents. She was a contributor to the ABMS NB ME proceedings paper on advancing assessment of professionalism and continuing certification. Um, 
and Dr. King is a member and a past chair of the United States Medical Licensing Exam Composite Committee. She's also served on US MLE and MBME test material development committees. Additional past services included the FSMB's State Board Advisory Group to the US MLE, the Interstate Medical Licensing Compact Task Force, and uh, the FSMB Duty to Report Symposium, FSMB representative to the INCAS conference, conference and editorial committee for the Journal of Medical Regulation. Dr. King is also a professor of medicine at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine, where she is active in medical school curriculum development and medical student teaching. She, uh, and uh, she has a practice in primary care internal medicine at the University of Vermont uh, Medical Group. So uh, Dr. King earned her PhD in uh, physiology from Brown University and her MD from the University of Vermont College of Medicine. She's board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. We're so happy to have her uh, with us. Uh, additionally, and we also have uh, Professor Kelly. Denny. Uh, Kelly is uh, somebody who we all know well here at St. Louis University. She uh, earned her JD with a health law concentration as well as her PhD with distinction in uh, healthcare ethics at St. Louis University and also was a member of our faculty and law school administration for uh, quite a while before leaving to direct the uh, health law program at Creighton University's School of Law, where she is also an associate professor. There, she teaches uh, current topics in public health law, health law and policy, bioethics, and torts. Uh, professor Deneen also has a secondary appointment as professor of medical humanities at Creighton University's School of Medicine. Uh, she has a background in nursing, including working with patients with chronic persistent pain. Dr. Deneen practiced in uh, the health law practice group at uh, Hush Blackwell after law school. And later, um, uh, she also held the academic positions at, at St. Louis University. Dr. Deneen is served by invitation for both the American Bar Association and the American Health Lawyers Association working groups on, opioid, on the opioid crisis, and is the current co-chair of the American Bar Association's Opioid Crisis Task Force and organizer of the upcoming meeting on the opioid crisis co-sponsored by the American Bar Association, the American Medical Association, and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. She also serves on the American Society of Addiction Medicine's P Practice Management and Regulatory Affairs Committee. She's an expert on health law, ethics, and policy, and, and researches and writes on issues related to public health policy, pandemic ethics, drug use, and health inequities and discrimination. Her recent work has focused on opioid prescribing and the impact of decision-making by policymakers and healthcare providers on people with substance use disorders, chronic pain, and mental illness. She is the co-editor and author of several chapters in Prescription Drug Diversion and Pain, History, Policy, and Treatment, which was published by Oxford University Press. She is also a sought-after speaker uh, with the, by media, and her work has been widely published. Again, we're so pleased to have both these expert, experts with us, uh, and I will allow the panelists to take it away. Um, thank you, Ron, for the introduction, and thank you, um, so much for inviting me. As Ron said, I'm Pat King. I am a past chair of the Federation um, of State Medical Boards Board of Directors and was the chair of the work group on sexual misconduct. Um, I am sitting in Burlington, Vermont, so it is not as warm as St. Louis, but I hope that your warm weather will soon be coming our way because we are ready to get rid of the snow, at least I am. Um, I am not a spring skier, so I would just as soon have green grass on the ground. Um, so, so to begin, um, what I'd like to do today is um, share with you um, a lot of the findings and recommendations that came out of our work group. Um, and I can begin by saying that the, the work group um, was started in my, um, in my year as chair. Um, and it really um, began in the wake of a lot of really egregious, large and very public um, sexual misconduct. Um, it both, both with Larry Nasser and Richard Strauss at Ohio State, but also in California, in New York, um, in many places around the country. And I have to add to that, that it also, we started the work group in the wake of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution um, series of articles on doctors and sexual abuse that actually um, 
first came out in July of, I think June or July of 2016. And the article was quite critical of state boards in general and some boards in particular. Um, and so these things together with growing concern of our state boards really um, made it clear that we needed to readdress our policy. So we did have a policy. The Federation did, um, did an, an evaluation and formed a work group in 2006. Um, and they, um, they produced a, a, some guidelines um, entitled Addressing Sexual Boundaries. And that was passed by the House of Delegates in 2006. And initially we thought, well, we can start with this and just do some revisions and updates. But I can say that as we worked through this um, issue and had more discussion and listened more to, to many groups and people that at, by the end of the um, process, we had completely changed and really didn't use much at all from the 2006 policy. It wasn't that it wasn't good then or even now, but it just really didn't um, give the, the best guidelines that we thought were, were necessary. <clears throat> so we started just to give you a little bit about our approach. Um, and I will say, I have to also, as I begin, thank the both WashU and St. Louis University for their work on the Greenwall Project. It has just been tremendous and really has complemented what we've done and a lot of what I will go over today has maybe already been stated by Tristan or Elizabeth. Um, so hopefully it won't be too redundant, but I'm so, so happy and so pleased that our, our work is really being synergistic. So our approach as theirs was very grassroots. We um, really wanted to speak with the state boards and see what the problems were for, they, for them and what they needed. But we also knew we could not do this on our own, that we needed other groups in medicine, in the House of Medicine. So we wanted to be both grass, grassroots and inclusive. Um, the work group um, represented 12 different state boards. It included both public and physician members, as well as the executive directors. We did put the, work, the group to work and required a lot of reading, including the, um, the publications on sexual misconduct that had been done by Dr. Dubois and his group. So that was part of the background that we set um, so that everyone could, could come together with some common knowledge as well as um, the perspective of their own state board. We heard from multiple stakeholders, representatives from the American Medical Association, from the American Osteopathic Association, from the AAMC, which are the medical colleges, and the AACOM, which are the osteopathic medical colleges, as well as students and others. I think most impactful, we heard from survivors directly. We invited them to our meeting and heard about their experience. And um, it was really very impactful on how we looked at this problem and what, and what needed to be done. We sought broader state medical board input at three over really over two and over two years and really three annual meetings where we had sessions on sexual misconduct and we had up to 200 um, board representatives in the room at some of these sessions, really um, just listening to what they had to say, as well as um, sending out state medical board surveys as another way of gathering their input. We had representation and input from international medical regulators, primarily from Canada and New Zealand, and then heard from subject experts, both in ethics and remediation. And these two people were on our work group. And then our entire work group heard from trauma, um, trauma-informed investigation um, experts. And I would like to, before I um, move on, I also really have to recognize Mark Staz, who is um, 
on the, the Federation um, staff as a consultant, and he really supported our work group um, tremendously in our efforts. So to begin, I'll start with the definition of sexual misconduct. We've already talked a little bit about this. Um, and we looked at the 2006 report and realized that um, it began with sexual misconduct is understood as behavior that exploits the physician-patient relationship in a sexual way. But then it went on to really list about 16 acts primarily involving physical conduct that were defined as sexual misconduct or, or boundary violations. And we really wanted to move away from listing um, specific acts and knowing that we could never really provide an exhaustive list or a complete list. And in addition, we really realized that it wasn't just physical conduct, contact, it, that sexual misconduct really took place along a continuum of severity. That misconduct was both verbal or physical, it could occur in person or virtually, and that along this continuum of severity, it might start with what might seem like innocuous acts, special treatment, preferred treatment, gift giving, that some people might call grooming or grooming um, activity. It continued to expressions of thoughts and feelings or gestures that are of a sexual nature or could be construed by the patient or family member as sexual. And then went on to what the 2006 report described as inappropriate physical conduct, contact on exam, physical contact that is explicitly sexual and finally sexual assault. And in the 2020 approach, we really felt that, that there was concern for acts at any point along this continuum, um, not just the more severe end of the continuum because earlier acts on this continuum, continuum could lead to more egregious acts in the future. And then it really was, as I think Dr. Dubois said in his introdu introduction, it really is the early identification that's so important for further misconduct, more egregious misconduct, and for prevention. So the other um, point I wanted to address that we were very curious about early on was that we knew about these very public um, egregious acts and we knew about our own state, but we wanted to get an idea of what the entire kind of balance was in terms of unprofessional conduct and, and sexual misconduct. And so we wanted to look at the state board actions. So, Whenever there, a state medical, a medical board has an action for discipline, it's sent into the Federation's um, Physician Data Center. And then the, the Federation then categorizes those based on the findings of facts as listed in the board action. And most often those are vague. And we realize that immediately, and I think Elizabeth has also um, pointed that out as well as Tristan. Um, and so the board actions are evaluated through the narrative to see if there's more information that can be identified to more precisely categorize them. And that is sometimes successful and, and sometimes not. But just as an example, I, I have these data shown here. And these are um, from 2019, but they were similar in 2000. 18 and 17. These are the state medical board disciplinary actions that by the coding were associated with professionalism or some type of unprofessional conduct. Um, this, this number totaled, um, it's actually 1,638 actions and represents about 20% of the total board actions 
for um, the year, which is usually around 8,500 board actions that are sent in. And as you can see, um, most of these are just listed as unprofessional conduct. And really just by reading the narrative, couldn't be any further deline delineated. There are some that are more specific, um, as you can see listed sexual misconduct, sexual boundaries, um, but many others that are vague, morally unfit to practice, um, unethical conduct, conduct unbecoming a physician. So they're not really specific. And the problem is they really do not provide information that gives transparency to the public, that warns the public, and that provides public protection. So this was a significant concern. And, and actually, when we looked at the Larry Nasser board actions that came in, I think over 18 months, there were four or five board actions from the Michigan um, State Board. And it really wasn't until the last board action when I think he had been found guilty of sexual assault that the board actual action actually stated sexual misconduct. So obviously transparency was a big issue for our work group and was one of our key recommendations. And besides looking at the data that we had, we also read this in the, in, in the AJC article, um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and we heard this from our survivors. So we felt that state boards should ensure that sufficient information is publicly available to justify regulatory decisions and to provide sufficient rationale to support them. This would require clear coding processes, accurate descriptions of behaviors underlying decision, consistent terminology between states. And this has been something that is, it seems like it should be easy, but we have 50 states and more territories and 70 state medical boards. Um, so it's, it's not easy to always generate consistency between boards, but our goal was to maximize reach and impact for the public. Now, the other um, issue we addressed, and this was all already brought up by Elizabeth, um, is that the state boards, um, their investigations are complaint driven. So um, we hear mostly from patients and family members State boards can pick up on news items and they can generate their own case based on that. Um, but in general, most complaints come from patients or, um, or family members. And the state boards felt like they really weren't hearing enough. They weren't really hearing the complaints. Our survivors told us that um, people were not complaining for a lot of different reasons, many of which Elizabeth and Tristan already pointed out um, that the public doesn't know how to make a complaint. Um, that was found in the, in the Harris poll that the, that the Federation did that Elizabeth presented. Um, very few people um, know how to find information about physicians and only half of people really even know what a state board is. But in addition, the survivors also um, told us, the survivors of sexual misconduct that they really struggled because they felt guilty. They weren't really sure what happened. They weren't really sure if something was wrong or right. And there was a certain amount of shame or guilt that really prevented, prevents survivors from reporting. So we really also focused on the need to support people when they come forward for complaints that there should be frequent communication with complainants about the complaint and about the investigative process so they understand that, so they understand how important it is to complain, that we address these complaints as quickly as possible. And if any of you know state boards, things don't always move quickly, but these should be moved as quickly as possible. And then we really should have people specially trained um, to help navigate complainants through the process and, and listen to them and, and their needs. 
So along with this, we have um, reporting from family and, and patients on complaints, but also as Elizabeth has pointed out, we knew the state boards knew that there were other sources of reporting that we weren't hearing from, primarily hospitals or other employee institutions, as well as other healthcare providers, including physician colleagues. So we had a series of, of recommendations, um, many of which echo what Elizabeth has said, the ability to levy fines against institutions for failing to report. We really felt that the results of peer review processes, which are often protected, um, but we felt should be shared with state boards when sexual misconduct is involved. We thought we really recommended that hospitals should be required to report to state boards where employed physicians have been dismissed or forced to resign due to concerns related to sexual misconduct. And then for physicians and other um, colleagues or healthcare providers, we really felt that they have a duty to report that if they report in good faith, they should be protected from retaliation. And um, if they fail to report that they should be liable for sanction. Um, the other area that we addressed um, really dealt much more with board function and it was investigations, and then I'll talk about discipline. So we, as I said, we have um, many boards across the country, and we have very differing laws on investigation as well as discipline. But we felt that one of the topics of discussion was what to do when an, a, a physician is being investigated with good findings of and reasonable probability that they've engaged in sexual misconduct. And the work group felt strongly that the state board should be able to impose interim terms or limitations and intervene to ensure the protection of the patient and the public during the ongoing investigation. Um, in addition, we felt that while there might be one instance or one act of egregious activity, the board should also be able to look back at previous complaints to identify a pattern. And that those, those rules or laws vary state to state, but we thought that was an important point, especially when looking at a continuum of unprofessional conduct and misconduct. And then finally, I have brought this up already, but um, we really felt that the state board staff as well as the state board members should be trained in trauma-informed procedures and the impact of trauma. We heard a lot about um, trauma from our survivors as well as from the um, trauma experts that we had in. And we heard from state boards. We heard from state boards who said, gosh, we have investigators who are very aware of trauma and they build a case and then they take it to the board for adjudication and the board knows nothing about trauma and really doesn't recognize um, the effects of trauma and how that can impact the survivor and how they come forward. So in order to really um, properly adjudicate, um, we felt that both the staff as well as the board members should have this training. Discipline is Dr. another King, area that- Sorry, Dr. State, Dr. State King, State. I just- Dr. Kim, I'm sorry. I just want to. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know that there's one one minute remaining in the. Okay. Time. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up here. Um, discipline varies a lot, state to state. There's um, varying burden, various burden of proof, and um, but we did feel that um, people should be able to have their license revoked for um, an egregious act and for um, repeated lesser acts. Um, Education, we've talked a lot about education for professionals as well as for patients. And I think both Elizabeth and Tristan have pointed on that. Culture is a big area. And I will add to what Elizabeth has said, um, public members, we worked so hard on trying to raise the presence of public members on state boards because they are so important and should have full participation and membership. 
And then finally, I just want to point out um, implementation by state medical boards. Since we um, approved our policy, and even before, many state boards have started to make changes. And I'm very, have been very impressed with the state of Georgia, where the Atlanta Journal Constitution um, paper resides. And just at the end of last month, their house passed a bill that, which approved by the Senate, would put into law many recommendations of the Federation Workgroup report training for board members on sexual misconduct, trauma, and implicit bias, summary suspension of licenses of a physician who's being investigated, CME and education, um, reporting by healthcare, admit, um, um, healthcare providers on, who have observed or have knowledge of sexual abuse. And then also the board will be required to um, report its handling of sexual misconduct cases to the legislature. So again, thank you. I'm sorry I went over. I just want a, to give you a couple of references. One is um, www.doc.info.org. That is a um, product of the Federation that is public and free. Anyone can go onto this website, enter any physician's um, name, and get information on the states in which they are licensed, as well as where, whether they have any board actions against them. If they click on board actions, it will connect them to the full action that they can read and also to the state website. Um, and in addition, there's a new added section here that describes for the public how to make a complaint as well as the complaint process. And then finally, I have a link here on um, to our sexual um, misconduct work group report. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. King. We really appreciate it. Um, and now I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Deneen. She's going to address defining wrongful prescribing. All right. I am really happy to um, be here. I just. Uh, uh, Patricia, could you stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that's okay. I think I can't <laughs> do anything with mine until you. Yes, I know. Okay. There you go. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Okay. So, um, of course, I am delighted to be here back, back in the saddle at my favorite law school. Um, I want to thank, uh, of course, Elizabeth Pendo for inviting me to be part of this um, great conference. Um, I want to thank everybody at the center, of course, the students who will be working on these articles in the summer and fall, and most of all, um, Amy Sanders, Cheryl Cooper, and Julie Orr, who keep everything uh, moving with these uh, kinds of events. So, all right. So, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we define egregious um, prescribing misconduct and um, more, and a little bit more about, well, what do we really know about this? Um, uh, what does the evidence tell us? Because uh, in this area, there's a lot of um, conjecture, but not a ton of great data. Okay, so I am using the um, definition from the team led by Dr. Dubois um, an egregious wrongdoing means the type of charge that, if found to be true, would merit suspension or revocation of a license, okay? Um, and boards have to make these decisions, of course, consistent with their state laws, um, rules, and guidance, but a lot of these decisions depend on the decision-making process and abilities of the people on the board. Um, so with that, I want, this is the audience participation part of my presentation. Um, I'd like everybody to look at this picture and just type a word or two into your chat, uh, describing sort of what this brings to mind for you. And I'll wait just a minute while uh, people work on that. And then I'm gonna call on my lovely assistant, Professor Gatter, to chime in with, uh, some of the themes he might see emerging. Well, right away, we're getting North America. Mm -hmm. 
map, the map of US, as well as antidepressants, uh, overprescribing as a national issue. Someone said, my weekend. Uh, people are overmedicated. A map showing the op opioid pers pers prescribing. Um, let's see. Yeah, overprescribing, not just in the US, but also in North America. Mm -hmm. Our answer to everything is a pill. Mm -hmm. PDM. Yeah. Yeah, PDM, PDMP. Yeah, so that's pretty consistent. Um, I actually got this map, not because I was looking for something like this, but I was at a um, perspective taking sort of workshop at, at my own institution. And there were a whole bunch of different pictures. There were like 14, 15 different pictures. And the groups had to get together and like write down what they thought of right away. And um, so the results, uh, for this it was the only picture in that exercise where um, addiction, oblivion, epidemic, addiction, overdose, opioid crisis, um, the, all of the answers were the same. So we all had the same perspective, right? Which was telling because in all of the other pictures, there were always a variety of rep, uh, perspectives represented. But there's a reason that we tend to anchor to opioids when we see this, even though nothing's labeled. Um, and that's because um, bias that happens uh, in our short-term uh, unconscious decision-making. And of course, uh, it makes sense that we would go there because we are bombarded with media attention over this issue, which is a serious issue. Um, but it's, it's all there, it's all loaded for our brains to sort of unconsciously go to when we see something like this. So um, just a little bit more about decision-making process. So this is kind of a combination of theories like dual process and fuzzy trace um, theories on cognition when we are making decisions, right? So uh, there's the sort of fast system, the efficient, don't have to think about it, just do it. Uh, system and then there's type two systems two which is sort of the slower i'm thinking about thinking i'm thinking through the process by which i'm making a decision um now we need both of them they're both really important we'd never get through a day uh much less an hour if we didn't have this intuitive system um and for most things that works pretty well right we don't or we're not always making monumental decisions we're not always um making a decision that's got a lot of capacity for bias. But when it comes to decisions about prescribing around opioids, there's a lot of potential for bias in this area called impressionistic thinking. Um, and that's where like implicit bias would sit, where we um, um, jump to conclusions about people and act on them without even thinking through uh, the actions. So, um, this is an area that needs some attention, I think, when we're making decisions about opioid prescribing and prescribers, right? Um, and so here are a few biases that I think are particularly at play in, when it comes to opioids. Um, so confirmation bias, sort of we, like we look for things that confirm what we have an intuition about anyway, right? So that oh, this is bad opioid prescribing. And so we will look for evidence to confirm that. Um, the availability bias, which is a little bit on display in that earlier exercise is this, the perceived likelihood of an issue is tied to how fast you can bring it up, meaning how salient is the issue for you. And, um, you know, there's been so much attention in media and public and scholarly discourse about opioids that um, of course, it, it tends to be a very salient issue for all of us. The danger of that though, is we, we sometimes overestimate some aspects while ignoring or minimizing some other dangers associated with opioid, which we, which we have um, over time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, then you get visceral biases. So people will even ask against their own self-interest if, it is an area that um, sparks indignation or disgust or anger. 
Um, and so given the populations with which opioids are associated, so people with pain, people with chronic pain, people with opioid use disorders, right? People who use drugs. These are all highly stigmatized groups, um, you know, including the state sanctioned stigmatization of drug use, right? So, so people have a, a less favorable, favorable opinion about them anyway, and especially when it comes to addiction, uh, there's still a lot of, um, you know, anger and disgust associated with that. Um, and then of course, indignation too comes in whenever uh, we perceive that sort of maybe a patient's taking advantage of a doctor, right? Or a doctor's not being careful, right? So we just need to be aware that those things will drive us to maybe make biased decisions and we need to be careful about that. Um, another one that's quite prevalent in um, issues around opioids and in fact, sort of endorsed by the law enforcement community and the legal system is this idea that people can tell when other people are lying. Um, and people really can't tell when other people are lying. And I bet most of you are sitting there going, yeah, but I can. Cause there's this also the self-serving bias that comes into this where we, we see ourselves as being, um, being the exception, right? And I do this too. Like, even as I say this, I'm like, but I'm better at it. But you no, know, really the social science research shows us we're not. Even with training, uh, we're maybe like a whisper above chance, like 50.4%. Um, so, so the fact that say undercover agents were prescribed a medication, even though they're not really sick, is not evidence that the prescriber is making errors. Um, and then, and I think I've sort of talked about this, I've described it in other writings about the sort of opioid heuristic where we um, focus it on this to the exclusion and the negative associations um, that we have about people who are associated with opioids and including the providers that take care of them. Okay, and I think that um, there may be some bias in some of the consensus items, honestly, that deal with uh, the strong consensus that uh, boards should be just checking PDMPs, um, sort of routinely searching them to find bad actors. Um, Jenna Leva is gonna talk a lot about that. You should tune in for it because it's gonna be good. Um, but, um, yeah, so there are just some issues. Okay. So what do we really know about the physicians that misprescribe? Well, so I'm going to rely on work from, um, Jim Dubois group and then an, a paper that Jim and I did together, um, to try and explain this. So some of you who are on boards might be familiar with the 4D model that was created in 1980 and endorsed by the AMA, but it, it, the process by which it was created was not um, evidence-based at all. So that 4D model tries to put prescribers into, misprescribers into one of four categories, dated, duped, dishonest, or disabled, right? And um, we did some, searches of the literature and some of the board actions and the case law and came up with an alternative model, which we called the three C's model, uh, which would instead divide um, misprescribers into roughly into one of three categories. So we've got the corrupt misprescriber, right? The person that prescribes out of self-interest and in disregard to the harm that they might cause. I mean, the classic example, right, is the doctor who sells prescriptions out of the parking lot, no exams, no nothing, right? That's, that's obviously corrupt. That's obviously egregious misconduct. Um, and that aligned with um, Dr. Dubois group's review of hundred cases that uh, created a typology that would align with the financially motivated misprescriber, right? Then compromised, um, 
by impairment is uh, what it sounds like. A, a prescriber has perhaps their own substance use disorder or other serious illness. And then careless. And so compromised for the most part is not egregious misconduct. Having a substance use disorder is a disease. And the stigma with which providers in particular have to face with having a substance use disorder, coupled with the fact that most physician, um, impaired physicians programs still do not allow evidence-based care for opioid use disorder, uh, may lead some physicians that have that condition to prescribe, you know, self-prescribe. Um, and so treatment should be the first um, approach to this. Um, and then third, the careless prescriber, and, and we categorize this as not as a one-off mistake, but a pattern of prescribing that indicates a, a serious deviation from the standard of care, but not to the point that it fits into the corrupt category. Okay, now that's the sort of categories of the prescribers. What do we know about the kind of prescribed being? Um, so the answer is everybody thinks they know what overprescribing is. And um, when I did this article published in 2019, uh, there existed no definition of overprescribing, not in any board, not in law, not in federal regulation. Um, and um, I began to see as I looked at different articles and things that were published about it that um, we were all over the place. And so I attempted to create a taxonomy so we would have some shared vocabulary to talk about this. So I'm gonna share that with you now. Um, okay, so here are the, the categories I came up with. I'm gonna explain them to you here. Um, so here are the first three. Inadvertent overprescribing. And this is really to address that dupe category I talked about before. Um, without more, this is not egregious misconduct. Uh, we would be punishing people for being human if it were. Um, next category, corrupt prescribing. Um, when they abandon their caregiving obligations, their fiduciary duties to their patients to leverage prescribing power for profit, right? Yes, that's, that's egregious. Um, now, here's where it gets a little grayer. And we all want a simple answer or a line to say at which to say like, that is egregious misconduct. But unless you have the person in the parking lot selling prescriptions, it's much more complicated. You need a multifactorial look in context to what was going on with the patient, with the provider, um, to really make any decisions. Okay, so qualitative overprescribing is what I would describe as um, a physician continuing to prescribe an opioid or other medication with little to no evidence of benefit to the patient relative to the risk. Okay, this this is the kind of thing that was, um, you know, some a lot of cases fall into this, right? Like, uh, you know, I started on it two years ago. Um, our visits have become quite routine. Um, I'm not carefully assessing each time if it's really working, if it's not, um, and thinking about um, these issues anew. Okay. And so that's going to depend completely on the facts of each case. Okay. Quantitative overprescribing. Now, this is something that got ignored for at least the first five years of the opioid crisis, even though we certainly knew at the exact same time and before um, that this was a major source of diverted um, drugs. And this is uh, the kind of thing we think of like the surgeon or the dentist prescribing you 30 day supply when 
logically you're only going to need a three day supply or a seven day supply. Um, and it's just a sort of reflexive thing, or even like when electronic, electronic medical records came onto the scene and sort of the defaults, what's the default rule for the post-op discharge of medication? Um, I've heard from a lot of physicians that the default was the 30 day supply or like 30 pills instead of like 15. So again, this is gonna depend on the facts of the case, okay. And then two that are particularly concerning to me are multi-class prescribing where opioids are prescribed with benzodiazepines or other drugs we know are increase the risk of overdose like gabapentin or to people who are heavy drinkers. Um, this is gonna depend on the facts, but um, I think it doesn't get enough attention. It seems like the boards are starting to pay a little more attention to this. And then under prescribing, which gets almost no attention, but is a huge issue, which is um, in response to personal fears, say about sanction uh, by the board, by the criminal system, you withhold appropriate opioids, you just make blanket exclusions, like, hey, I, don't, I just don't prescribe opioids anymore, okay? Like not in any context of a patient or uh, forced involuntary tapering or discontinuation of opioids, even when you know that's not in the patient's best interest and um, refusals to consider prescribing or referring patients for medication for opioid use disorder, which is the absolute gold standard, most effective by orders of magnitude uh, treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, okay. So just a word about multi-class misprescribing, um, and I know I'm running up against time here, but essentially at least one study has showed the risk of overdose death when you co-prescribe opioids and benzodiazepine is 10 times higher. So adding that benzodiazepine increases your risk of overdose death tenfold, okay? Also, we know that what happened as, um, laws and policies got more stringent about opioid prescribing. So as the opioid prescribing went down, benzodiazepine prescribing went up, right? Why? Because everybody was fixated on opioids and looking the other way. But this is dangerous, perhaps more dangerous in many cases than patients being on opioids. Okay. And then finally, under prescribing, all right? This really started taking off after the CDC guidelines came out in 2016. The guidelines themselves are quite reasonable. If you read them in context, right, for the populations they were talking about. But it soon became clear that people were um, being like just reduced to the top morphine equivalent that's in the CDC guidelines, even after being on years of much higher doses, people were being taken off of them. They use the top dose um, to sort of over comply. Um, some insurance companies even said like, okay, 90 is the top dose. So we're gonna flag everybody who's over 30 or 40 because then we'll really catch the people. Um, and this has had terrible consequences. Suicides have gone up because of this. I, I, now on this day, I can say that it's certain. Um, when I've talked about it previously, a lot of the evidence has been anecdotal, but Suicides have gone up, overdose rates have gone up because people turn to less safe street um, and illicit uh, sources of opioids, right? And um, so we've just got an avalanche of information now that involuntary tapering and other practices like this are really hurting people and killing people. And we have to be accountable for that. Dr. Dini, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. I just wanted to let you know we're right up against the time limit and wanted to leave some time for Q&A. So if you have a chance to wrap up. Yes, I'm going to wrap up right now. So at any rate, these, these things happen. Then they started getting attention from international groups of physicians and other providers that treat uh, people with addiction or opioid um, or, or, or chronic pain who receive opioids. And um, in 2019, we finally get a uh, FDA warning and labeling changes uh, because of the risk of death. 
And um, we get the lead author of the CDC guidelines publishes uh, a strong statement saying we might have gotten this, you know, this has been taken way out of context. Please, 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 please realize it's a guideline and a few other things. And so from what I could see, I have one, I found one case of the state medical board that has taken action against a doctor for abruptly discontinuing uh, opioids in a patient. Um, uh, the patient became suicidal afterward, and um, then he discharged him from care, which is a common reaction. But I, I was glad to see there's at least been one, one case, because this is important. Um, and so here are my recommendations. I can just leave those up maybe while we're taking questions and people can read through them. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, you know, in context, take any complaints about abrupt or involuntary discontinuation seriously, um, that it's not the case that like, well, what are we gonna do? They gotta get them off those opioids. That may not be the case. Um, engage appropriate experts. It's really important that boards have experts that can speak to the range of options within sort of the standard of care continuum. Um, and, you know, physicians can be fooled. There's overwhelming evidence that supports medication treatment for opioid use disorder. Perhaps consider either a disability associated with opioids or you know, robust experience in treatment of patients that fall in these categories as a component of board diversity and treat substance use disorder as a disease, not a moral malady. So I hate to interrupt, uh, but this is, it's so fascinating. I feel so fortunate that we've had uh, both these experts here with us. There are a few questions. And so what I thought I'd do is borrow just a little bit of time. I know we're up against a break, but I thought I'd borrow uh, a few minutes of time from the break in order to address a couple of questions. Um, I have a few, I'm gonna narrow it down. Um, Dr. Deneen, since we, your presentation just ended, why don't I start with a question that was addressed to you? Uh, what about, an, an impaired provider who sells scripts to support their own addiction, what, under what category would you say that falls? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one, right? Because um, if they're selling them to other people, um, that, that does pose a tangible risk to others, right? And um, that's rough. Like, I still think it makes sense to start with treatment if they're amenable, you know, and then uh, you could consider that as part of a pattern if there are future problems. But um, it's really difficult because it is a disability and the cravings are overwhelming from everybody I've talked to. And um, we do not give people, people don't feel like they can admit their problem or get help. Um, even people who have lots of resources like physicians. So there's, uh, there's a question that, although it was directed to, to Dr. King, I would imagine both of you would have an opinion on in, your, in, in the substantive area of your presentations. But uh, Dr. King, what would you suggest as a means to encourage physicians who have a problem with professional sexual misconduct to come forward and self-report so as to get help with the problem without the fear of some sort of severe sanction or permanently losing their license? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. So certainly, um, in the case of um, substance abuse um, and other and other um, problems, every state has a um, a physician health program um, for self reporting. Um, you could self report directly to the board. I think in the case of sexual misconduct, the board has a responsibility really for public protection. So depending on what the um, what the acts were, what the behaviors were, um, it would it would have to go through an evaluation, and and then if there really was risk to the public, um, depending on that, could this be could there be a remediation program, or and following that ongoing monitoring um, that might involve the practice some type of practice monitor or other limitations, I think would. Um, would have to be done for public protection. 
Again, it's um, in an evaluation, a psychiatric evaluation, which could be done through the PHP program to look at other factors that are involved. Um, I think any board would work with someone who is coming forward, again, knowing that their first responsibility is for public protection. So I do have um, then a, a question I think I'll close on that was directed to both of you. How can the types of bias that each of you addressed be acknowledged and addressed, especially in the context of group decision making? Have you seen evidence that diverse groups are better positioned to do this? Uh, and why don't we I'll have uh, Dr. Deneen go first, then Dr. King, you can wrap it up. Well, I learned from Elizabeth Pendo about the great uh, literature on the benefits of diversity on a board for decision making. Um, so I would imagine the answer is yes. In terms of the kinds of things that I talked about, I think there are a number of strategies um, that individuals can take. I think a number of uh, cognitive forcing strategies like cr creating a uh, checklist and criteria that really have to be evaluated um, for each case might be helpful. Um, I would imagine uh, Jim Dubois would also have some really good thoughts on this. Uh, he's done a lot of work around um, uh, mitigating biases and decision making in certain contexts as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, and then I think the first step though is understanding that we all have biases and have having training on that and then um, figuring out what strategies you can use. Dr. King, anything to add? Sure. Um I will say that I think in terms of sexual misconduct, obviously gender diversity is critical. Um, in terms of sexual misconduct and in general, I have personally found that the presence of public members makes a huge difference. They are not part of the profession and they really, really look at things differently as a patient and as a public person. I also will add that it's you know, being on the medical board, at least, it, it is a fair amount of work. I mean, people are spending hours, hours reading through records. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to get people to serve. So I think um, it is always best when there's diversity. But also, as Kelly said, all, you know, taking time to do implicit bias training with the board, with the members you have, to try to also improve your your current membership um so but it, it definitely makes a difference and and um i think as i said before the full participation of public members is a key thing on medical boards well thank you very much um so applause applause for the thank for the you. panelists we really appreciate it um uh, i'm gonna let um amy talk to us about the break, but before we go, just you may have seen in the chat, those who were presenting, that there are some questions in the question and answer area that didn't get uh, addressed live here. There is an opportunity to, for any panelists to type an answer back on any of those as well. All right, welcome everyone. We are going to get started with our last panel of the symposium. I am going to introduce the speakers in the order that they will be going, and then uh, we will go ahead and get started. My name is Rakaya Yerby. I am a law professor at St. Louis University, a member of the Center for Health Law Studies, as well as co-founder and executive director for the Institute for Healing Justice at St. Louis University. Our first speaker will be Jennifer Oliva who is an associate professor and director of the Center for Health Law, for Health and Pharmaceutical Law at Seton Hall Law, where she specializes in health law and policy, FDA law, drug policy, evidence, and complex litigation. An honors graduate of Georgetown University Law Center, uh, where I also attended. Professor Leva was a public interest law scholar and served as executive notes and comments editor of the Georgetown Law Journal. Prior to attending law school, Professor Leva earned a master's in business administration at Baylor College, I'm sure I said that wrong, Oxford University. She was elected as a Rhodes and Truman Scholar while a cadet at the unit 
United States Military Academy. Um, her bio is quite long. I am going to stop there, though, and move on uh, to our next speakers. And I apologize in advance if I am mispronouncing anybody's name. Uh, so uh, our next um, presentation will be done by Lisa Lampkin Broom. Uh, Burton Craig, Distinguished Professor and Director of the Center for Banking and Finance at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Law. She is uh, the Director of the Center for Banking and Finance, Faculty Advisor to the North Carolina Banking Institute Journal and Head of the School's uh, Director Diversity Initiative, which works to increase the gender, racial, and ethnic ethnic diversity on corporate boards of directors. Room also serves as the university's faculty athletics representative to the Atlantic Coast Conference and the NCAA. She joined the faculty in 1984. She has served as the law school's associate dean for academic affairs from 1993 to 1995. She teaches banking law and secure transactions and rights in those areas and on corporate board diversity. Broom co-authored Regulation on Bank Finance Service Activities with Jerry Markham and its accompany, accompanying statutory supplement with the fifth edition published in 2008. She also co-authored Securization, Structured Finance and Capital Markets. Uh, which was in LexisNexis uh, 2004 with Steve Schwartz and Bruce Markle. And she received the McCall Award for Teaching Excellence in 1986, 1992, 1995, and 1998. Our next uh, speaker who will be presenting with her is Professor John M. Conley, University of North, and he teaches at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Law as well. He is a William Brand Keenan Jr. Professor at the UNC from Duke University, where he was editor-in-chief of the Duke Law Journal. After practicing in Boston and Charlotte, he joined the UNC faculty in 1983. He teaches civil procedure, intellectual property, scientific evidence, biotechnology, and life sciences law, and a professional responsibility course called The Law Firm, in which he and the students interview a wide range of practicing lawyers about their professional lives. Conley's research interests include the anthropological study of institutions and organizations, including law firms, investment organizations, corporations, and scientific enterprises, and the application of intellectual property law to emerging technologies. His current research project, conducted in collaboration with UNC Center for Bioethics, is examining the governance of new gene editing technologies. His books include Rules versus Relationships, The Ethnography of Legal Discourse, Just Words, Law, Language and Power, which recently appeared in a third edition and multiple editions of two case books. Last but not least, Professor Liz Chiarello. She is an associate professor of sociology at St. Louis University with secondary appointments in law and bioethics. As a medical sociologist and sociolegal scholar, Professor Chiarello examines intersections between healthcare and law with a specific focus on legal and organizational factors that shape frontline decision-making in medicine and pharmacy. Her book, Policing Patients, is under contract at Princeton University Press, and it examines how healthcare providers begin to police instead of treat patients when armed with a law enforcement surveillance technology, the prescription drug monitoring program. She is also conducting a project that examines how professional boards approach opiate prescribing and how it has changed over time using 20 years worth of medical and pharmacy board data in three states. She, uh, her research is supported by National Science Foundation Career Award and she was a 2019-2020 Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard University. She has received multiple awards from the American Sociology Sociological Association, and her work has been featured in various outlets, including NPR, US News and World Report, Radcliffe Magazine, the St. Louis Post Dispatch, and our own SLU Law Summations podcast. And so with that, I will turn it over uh, to Professor Oliva 
who will start us off. Center for having me. It's, it's always a privilege and an honor. Thank you so much to Professor Elizabeth Tendo for, for inviting me and doing this important work. And huge thanks always to Amy, Cheryl, and Julie for putting up with me and um, doing such a fabulous job. I will note at the beginning that I am particularly interested in this research and thankful for the project because I actually, when I was much younger and, and unjaded, uh, uh, started my career in the Delaware Attorney General's office and, and had the privilege of um, representing boards. I was mostly on the litigation side because I don't really have good bedside manner for sitting with boards and using those soft skills, but I did get to sit with the boards from time to time when I subbed in for folks. So I, I think this is a particularly important project. All right, there's my agenda, I'll move along. Um, so I wanna start out by talking about surveillance tools. Uh, Professor Deneen was kind enough to kind of give an introduction to this uh, a bit, um, but there's been three primary surveillance tools that have been used to sort of monitor uh, opioid prescribing uh, in the midst of our uh, crisis. Prescribing guidelines, you heard about the CDC guidelines and the walk back there and how they've been misinterpreted. Uh, second, opioid treatment contracts. And, and many people don't know this, but um, 26 states actually have either laws or regulations that require providers in this context that are treating folks who take opioids as the analgesics or uh, to treat opioid use disorder. They're required to have a special contract uh, and the terms of those contracts is its own talk, uh, um, and but that's another way that surveillance is conducted on, on those two groups of patients. And number three, my uh, focus and area of research right now, which are prescription drug monitoring programs, which are state laws and regulations. Okay, so let's look at the prescribing OD stats real quick. I know most of you all know this. Here's where we're at right now, 2019. Um, you can see the bend of the arc Professor here. Professor Oliva, sorry to bother you. We can't yeah. see your slides moving. You're still on the first page. I just wanted to let you know. You don't have to stop, but uh, and we can make the slides available um, later on. But I just wanted to let you know as you were uh, focusing people in on your beautiful slides. <laughs> oh my God, what is happening? I even practiced this. What a Oh my gosh. Can you see them now? Yes. Yep. And it does it say total prescription opiates at the it top? It does. All right. Does. So here's the bend of the arc that I was showing you guys. It is actually my first interesting slide. So don't, don't worry about what you missed. Um, and we can see that prescribing is way down. In fact, lower than um, at 2005, but certainly lower than peak around 2012. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to point out, and I think that this is important, is that we're down no matter how you sort of break out the stats. It's not just that we're down total MMEs, you can see that we are uh, morphine uh, milligram equivalents, but total scripts, pills per person, and days per person, some items that Professor Deneen talked about earlier. Okay, unfortunately, despite that, that what looked, looks like a good couple first slides here, uh, we, uh, overdose deaths are way up. And you can see that the CDC actually issued an advisory alert in December. Uh, and they looked back at a 12 month period, you can see there saying it's, this is a worsening of the epidemic and it's the worst drug overdose 12 month period ever recorded in American history. Uh, driving this is uh, now, as we've gone through these stages and you'll see in the next couple slides is um, synthetic illicit synthetic opioid uh, drug involved deaths. Uh, and that's what the CDC headline is. And that's a report that I referred, referred to and I'd be happy to share that with anybody, but that's the alert that I'm talking about. We, we talk about this in three waves, right? Um, we went from we over prescribing and having deaths associated with RX opioids to um, a huge increase in heroin. And then um, now on the synthetic deaths that I was, gonna, that I was talking about. Um, overdose deaths are six times higher in 2018 than 1999. That's not the way we want to be going, even though we're shoving prescribing way down. The other thing I just want to show right here is that there are several categories of other drugs of concern uh, that have higher overdose deaths right now than opioids, and those include um, uh, several stimulant categories in, in cocaine. Um, okay, so here's overall over, opioid, or I'm sorry, all drug overdose deaths, excluding alcohol and tobacco. And you can see this peaking up. One thing I want to point out since my talk is about gender and racial bias is the difference in overdose deaths between men who are in the yellow line and women. And then this is opioids and you can see an even larger disparity between uh, men and women uh, in the overdose death category there. Okay. Um, prescription opioids are down. I've already said all that. Let's move on. So let's talk about pain right now. The first category of patients that I'm going to talk about are people with persistent or chronic pain conditions. Uh, this is the number one reason why folks in the United States 
seek healthcare treatment and it's the number one disability in the United States. In fact, I, I frequently say to people, if, if you live long enough, uh, you yourself will have a pain related disability, okay? It's almost inevitable. The numbers of folks uh, that suffer from persistent pain in the United States is huge. Studies vary between 50 and 100 million people. So you, that's just a huge number. Um, these patients have a long history in the United States of uh, under treatment and under assessment. Um, doc, I just recently wrote a paper and I was not for lack of studies that have gone out and found serving doctors and patients that doctors find these patients particularly difficult, untrustworthy, often use words like malingering and drug seeking. Uh, so long stigmatized, just like patients who um, are being treated for substance use disorder. Uh, the other thing that I found and spent quite, quite a bit of time on the paper was that there's been a long history of sexism and racism here as well. Uh, women are often viewed as, uh, their pain is viewed as uh, less uh, uh, tr trustworthy than men's patients. They're also often viewed as being psychosomatic, uh, hysterical, which is a word, obviously a word that derives from misogyny. Um, and then of course, uh, really old tropes about um, Black people, people of colors, physical superiority and pain tolerance, which really goes back to uh, old eugenics notions, uh, back to slave breeding and things like that that are really offensive. Uh, here you see one of my favorite guys, I use him a lot in FDA law, and, and uh, John Oliver, and he had a, a segment in August of 2019 where he had he, he showcased a, a female comedian, one of my favorites, Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes actually had a BRCA gene, and so she had a prophylactic double mastectomy. And in the comedy routine, uh, she goes on to say, you know, whereas for white people, you know, opioids were available like Tic Tacs back in the aughts. Um, when she was released from the hospital, she was um, sent home after the uh, prophylactic double mastectomy, literally with a bottle of ibuprofen. Um, and she's saying that because it's true. Um, she's saying that because it's true. Black people were entirely undertreated. There's studies on this. Um, the, the sort of racial divide runs so deep here that small black children are grossly undertreated for pain when they have bone breaks and things like that. I mean, this is super rampant in medicine. And like I said, there's no lack of studies. And again, you see these dates, these are 2020. I just wanted to show you that this isn't old timey stuff from back in the day. Okay, here we are right here, hysterical women, hypochondriacs, and all of these kinds of things real recent. Um, here's a study that a lot of people point to, and I think this is really important because of what I'm going to show you about what medicine's reaction has been to saying that there's a lot of racism and sexism and pain treatment and substance use disorder. Uh, this is a, you can see here, this study was approved in uh, 2016, so there's nothing too old about it, all right? The findings are dramatic and quite shocking, and what they are basically is they surveyed a bunch of lay white folks and then they surveyed a bunch of medical students and residents. So these are people who are pretty new doctors right now that they surveyed in 2015. Okay, they had these folks overwhelmingly maintain beliefs that would cause um, black patients to be grossly underassessed and undertreated for pain. 50% of medical students uh, believed any one of these four things that I'm actually not going to read because I've read it a number of times and it always gets me in a bad mood, but just crazy myths about people that are absolutely completely physiologically false. Uh, and those are new medical residents. So that's a very recent study. I'd like to show that. Um, the reaction to this was uh, entirely unsurprising, but really disappointing. Um, we have two white guys here in the uh, New York Times. I was super happy to get their picture up so you guys will believe me, um, where, where they wrote an article admitting that there's tons of implicit and explicit bias here and that Black patients have suffered egregiously uh, in the pain treatment context, but um, also, you know, a rare case where they should be grateful and, and thankful for that, like proving Wanda Sykes's uh, comedy was on point. This happened this week. I don't need to beat you guys down with it. If anybody's on Twitter, you know this happened this week with John. I mean, no physician is racist. How can there be structural racism in healthcare? I actually listened to the podcast. I, I taped it in case anybody needs it later on because I imagine they've pulled down the tweets. They're probably going to pull the podcast down too. But this was, you know, folks going on and on about doctors aren't racist, um, even though the history of medicine is, is, is imbued with racism. And the AMA itself wouldn't even allow Black doctors into the organization until the late 1960s. I mean, that's it's not hard to sort of make this case. Another thing I want to point out is SAMHSA and some of the agencies in the federal government have been pretty good about this, but the newspaper and the media has it so much. Um, there have been dramatic increases in overdose rates associated with people of color, Black people, Hispanics, et cetera. And you can see here that SAMHSA got so upset about this in 2020 and how underreported 
it is a category of concern. You can see here from 2011 to 2016, compared to all other populations, you're seeing the highest OD rates uh, with the synthetic fentanyl uh, with um, uh, people of color and black people. And, and so I think this is really important. This has been the narrative. This is the white problem that seems to persist, unfortunately, in the media. Um, but that's factually inaccurate right now. And I think that that has not gotten nearly enough attention. Um, here again, um, in addition to um, the fact that um, we have all of this other stuff going on, the treatment of opioid use disorder is really racially divided, okay? We have uh, in the suburban context for people who can pay, white folks often getting Suboxone. You can see that white young man in crisis in the corner. And then you see the pictures in the New York Times from this article I have here showing, you know, predominantly people of color in long lines waiting to get their methadone, which has a lot more requirements attached to it. It's a lot more tricky to get treated with it, even though methadone is the gold standard treatment. And Professor Nien already brought that up. So there's some recent pictures on that. So let's talk about these prescription drug monitoring programs. I think that most folks here know what they are, which is a quick overview. These things have a long history. They developed in New York State and then California and Bureau of like Narcotics Enforcement. They were There's no question that they were law enforcement tools. They continue to be law enforcement tools because they're funded by federal DOJ under a, a grant program and are advocated by the DEA. Some states have kept them in law enforcement agencies. California is the biggest state that has its PDMP in the state's attorney general office. As a, as a law enforcement tool. It's not even in a board of pharmacy. They don't even pretend that it's not a law enforcement tool, which is very honest of California. What these things do is they track prescribing of controlled substances as a general rule. They used to just track schedule two drugs where you find most opioids is in schedule two and a few on schedule three like buprenorphine, right? They've expanded out to schedule five and other drugs of concern. In the state of Nebraska, Professor Denise's home state actually tracks all prescriptions, all Rx drugs. So we're sort of seeing this movement. Even more concerning is that we have all this sort of AI attached to these programs now in the software. We have a risk score, predictive risk scoring and all sorts of things that we're used to hearing about in policing and surveillance. So now uh, these PDMPs don't just give you a prescribing list. Here's, here's the patient, here's what they've been prescribed to make sure you, know, you aren't co-prescribing benzos with opioids and this kind of stuff as Professor Deneen discussed. Instead, this algorithm is running behind the scenes, this pr proprietary algorithm run by a private company saying this person's at risk of opioid use disorder. Watch what you're doing, doctor. And by the way, they also run doctor reports, as I'm sure the, sure the board's, board's well aware. Here's a prescriber report card. Okay, so this is just an example, uh, and they look for prescribers. I would note here that the way that the PDMPs work as a general rule, each state's heterogeneous, however, is that they sort of look regionally at doctors to find out where the mean is in prescribing, usually on an MME basis without taking into account the type of practice that the physician has. So this goes back to stuff that Professor Deneen was saying. If you're the only oncologist or you're in a rural area of West Virginia and you're the only prescriber who is in addiction management, pain management, this can really affect you because you are gonna be the highest prescriber. And that is gonna set off the alarms because of the algorithmic design of the system. So the question is, are PDMPs effective? They are really effective at reducing prescribing. I showed you those charts in the beginning. You've already heard that they have encouraged physicians who are worried about their livelihoods, having their controlled substance license suspended by the DEA, or getting in trouble with the boards. Um, they've pushed down prescribing, but also a lot of physicians are just don't want to be in this business anymore. Um, they force tapered some patients. You saw the New Hampshire cases. The only case is, is correct there. They've abandoned patients and just have gotten out of the business. But this also changed patients' behavior, this kind of surveillance. Um, you know, they, they want to get away from prescribers and dispensers that they feel like are not listening to their needs or forced tapering them, void treatment altogether, and worse, the worst possible collateral consequence here is switching to these more dangerous illicit substances where we're really seeing, you know, the overwhelming majority of overdose deaths right now. All right, um, so these PDMPs have not been evaluated too, too much, but the couple studies that have been done um, basically say that PDMPs uh, uh, are, are really challenging to defend. Um, because um, there any decrease that they have in um, prescribing RX opioids, which are FDA approved medications that we, we know what they are. You don't know, know what you're getting out on the street with lacing um, is offset by the number of illegal deaths. And this is a very recent study from the Journal of Health, Health Economics. I usually don't com compliment economists, but they're the ones who are actually doing this for us right now. Here's another uh, health economist, Angela Kirby. She did a great study. What she did was she tried to model even though this is predictive software, she tried to model the software to see if it's wor it works or it's effective. And she did, a, she did her own study. Her findings are that the risk scores 
that PDMPs generate, if you just look at the risk scores, completely uncorrelated with actual risk and the proxies that they use are invalid, okay, to actually help patients. I really want the board folks that are on here today to hear this. It's really important. <clears throat> here are the proxies that are used. These might sound like good proxies, but they actually create another layer of race and gender bias and all sorts of other biases, poor people, rural bias, complex comorbidity, people with certain disability biases because of what they actually do. Number of providers you have, number of pharmacies, amount and strength of medication, the overlapping medications we've already talked about. But look at these other factors, distance traveled. If you don't have a provider in your county, if you have to go further away, that can be held against you. There are nine states in the United States right now that don't even have a methadone clinic in state. So if you live in the state of Wyoming, you have to cross the state line. How does that state PDMP factor that in? Do they take that into account? I don't know. These are black box algorithms, but it's problematic. As more and more doctors or prescribers want to get out of this game and are concerned about surveillance, you necessarily, through no fault of your own, have to travel further and further from home. You also then accumulate within a certain period of time, more and more prescribers. A recent study came out showing about doctor shopping saying 20% of the people that are that the system tags as doctor shoppers are called doctor shoppers through no fault of their own. They're cancer patients who have multiple different prescribers because of the way the practice of medicine works in a hospital and in the oncology setting and that the PDMP doesn't take that into account at all. The PDMP, what's missing here? You don't see anything about the patient's condition. You also don't see anything about patient outcomes and you most certainly don't see anything about how the patient's managing on their medication because they don't measure that. Method of payment, if you're underinsured or uninsured, this is gonna affect women and people of color and black Americans more. You're under, underinsured, you get penalized. You pay in cash one time, a credit card another time, your insurer's not paying for any number of reasons, you get penalized. And then the last two categories, which I spend a lot more time on in the paper, sexual abuse and trauma history over penalizes women because they over-report it. Not only do they over-report it, they're, oh, they're, there are a bunch of studies that show that women are more commonly diagnosed with sexual history trauma because of the way the DSM-5 criteria work. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but they've done, uh, they've done some nice papers on that. Uh, and that's also just in and of itself concerning. Uh, and then criminal history. And I, I have a litany of terrible statistics in the paper that show that is automatically going to grossly penalize uh, people of color and poor people in this country. So what are my concerns? And then I'll be done here. The NARC care, the NARC's care algorithms that we're all relying on to diagnose and treat patients and look at and the boards will look at when they look at these reports are secret and proprietary. The only reason why I know those criteria in them is because I went to the company's websites and looked at all the uh, pitch and marketing materials they gave out. And these were the criteria that they told us, tell us publicly that they use. They've never been externally validated. Professor Kirby looked at it and said, boo, um, and she knows what she's doing. So. They don't measure patient outcomes. They purport to measure something that folks who are experts in the field have a difficult time measuring. Remember when Professor Deneen said, we all think that we're good at detecting lying, but we're not. We're not professionals in this field struggle to predict who is gonna develop opioid use disorder. Okay, it's a complex etiology that involves a lot of different factors, but now we have a, an algorithm that apparently has figured it out, even though the folks putting the input in the program themselves would struggle. Um, they they uh, penalize patients for things well outside their control, um, and they have incentivized some of this um, some of this behavior, um, the surveillance, is, you know, pay, force tapering, um, sending people into the emergency room with chronic, you know, depression and uh, opioid withdrawal. And then, like I said, my big point here, to take away point, is that be careful about the AI you're using or like anything that you're using to measure this. We have a, two fields that have a demonstrated history of egregious bias towards women and black people for sure and other people of color, okay? And now we've layered on a tool that itself on its face appears to just double and triple down on those gender and racial biases. Um, so I say at the end, that's my fantastic line, NARC scores an aggravated uh, atrocious situation. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna finish up here. You guys can look at this later. The FDA actually has a, uh, a risk a risk measuring um, software as a medical device, which is what this is when it's used diagnostically, a uh, rubric. And my argument, there's three criteria is that PDMPs, there's no chance they will pass any of them. So if the FDA stopped exercising enforcement discretion here, most of these um, algorithms will be pulled from the market under federal law. Um, so I will um, end with that. Thank you for your time. And sorry about my technical problems at the beginning. Uh. Well, I will, uh, I'll start then. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, Lisa and I are going to go back and forth. We're going to be 
drawing on some extensive interview-based research we did on corporate boards a few years ago, wherein we interviewed uh, all kinds of players in the corporate board world, directors, executives, lawyers, headhunters, regulators, consultants, uh, and on the literature we reviewed in doing that research, and also uh, some work I've done on legal discipline in connection with uh, my teaching of professional responsibility. So I'm gonna begin by reviewing some of the arguments from four, four diverse boards that Lisa and I encountered in our corporate research. And uh, the ones on the left come largely from the literature, the ones on the right of the slide from our own research, things that people told us about. Uh, Fairness, and fairness means a couple of things when you argue for board diversity. Uh, it means what fairness means in the broadest sense against the history of discrimination is simply the right thing to do to diversify corporate boards. Uh, it also means fairness in the sense of uh, the directors of an organization that strives to be diverse uh, should themselves be diverse. Then there are as a category that's usually referred to as business justifications, things that arguably affect the bottom line. Although this literature is uh, mixed on the ability to prove that, but these are the arguments. There's an untapped talent pool out there, which you're ignoring if, you're, if you have a board solely uh, of white males. Uh, a reduction in agency costs, uh, business and legal, theory term uh, that refers to self-dealing by management. That's an agency cost. Uh, management enriching themselves sometimes at the expense of the shareholders and stakeholders. You reduce agency costs, it is argued, because diverse boards are less likely uh, simply to cave and defer to management in whatever management wants. Uh, more diversity means that the directors themselves bring more uh, and better information to the table, information in the broadest sense, uh, not only specific knowledge, but life experience. Uh, boards with more diversity operate differently than white male boards, and that difference is in a positive direction. If you look at the recent history of corporate scandal, uh, it's hard to say that all white male boards could operate worse. So diversity is thought to change operation, uh, interaction in a positive direction. Signaling, uh, signaling to various kinds of observers, observers and main groups there would be employees and customers. Uh, personally, I don't know about that. I don't know how many employees know who's on the board. I don't know how many customers know who's on the board, but that's an argument that's out there. Uh, and then a, a cynical argument under business justifications, it will shut people up. Uh, if the board looks diverse, diversity advocates will go bother some other company uh, and not yours. Some things we learn from our own qualitative interview-based research. It is strongly believed that diverse perspectives brought by diverse people on a board help avoid groupthink. Uh, groupthink is used all the time uh, by corporate people and it's everybody moving in lockstep. And diversity can disrupt groupthink and can avoid lemming effects, everybody parading off a cliff together. The Venus and Mars uh, rationale, as it's often phrased, referring obviously to gender diversity, that women and men bring different life experiences to the board. They tend to analyze problems in different ways and they tend to be sensitive uh, to different kinds of concerns. So melding those perspectives on a board is thought to be good. Uh, this does rest on a gender binary. I don't think corporate people have moved all that far uh, beyond a gender binary, but this is where it was when we heard it. Signaling to employees. Again, 
Do employees know who's on the board? Well, if they do, uh, it is thought to be good to signal to them uh, that the board reflects the diversity of the workforce. Uh, developing empathy with employees and customers. This isn't signaling, but this is understanding, as the word empathy suggests. Uh, different kinds of people in various ways on the board will appreciate uh, the problems that different kinds of employees face and also that the needs of customers uh, will differ and there'll be more understanding of those needs which can have a bottom line effect. Uh, the pipeline succession argument, this one cuts both ways. Uh, in some contexts, it's an excuse for lack of diversity. Well, there's no pipeline. There just aren't any qualified people. Uh, in a more positive sense, it refers to building uh, a pipeline for your company, uh, for companies generally, and that may not have immediate effect, but that's good down the road. It's good for recruiting employees when they see a pathway to the top. Succession, when a CEO has to be replaced, that's done by the board. Uh, and a diverse board will look more broadly uh, when making the hire uh, of the next CEO. So it'll tap a broader talent pool and respond to the need with a broader range of concerns. And then moral imperative uh, related to fairness. We just have to do this. Just look at history. Regardless of any other argument, it, it needs to be done. It is the right thing. A couple of final thoughts before I turn it over to Lisa. Uh, there is evidence in the legal, social, psychological, business literature that heterogeneity in groups is itself a good thing heterogeneity measured in all kinds of ways. And in particular, there's some research on judicial decision-making that when courts act in panels, like three judge panels on a court of appeals, uh, you get not only different, but you get a better quality, a better informed uh, kind of decision-making than you do when you have judges acting alone. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa at the very end after bringing up other kinds of evidence, we're going to revisit the question of which of these arguments might apply to medical boards. Well, thank you, John. And, and let's just start by setting the stage and looking at some corporate board diversity numbers. And in listening to this morning's presentation, it struck me that it would be helpful in the project that uh, you all are undertaking to understand what do these numbers look like on the medical boards that you are concerned about. So on corporate boards, um, there are some numbers from a few years ago. I'm pleased to report that they are probably all higher now, but the percentage of female board members on the Fortune 100 companies, the very largest companies was 25%. And then it uh, moves down. Uh, the bottom one is the North Carolina top 50 public companies, which includes some really big ones, but also a number of very small companies in our state. And this uh, shows that sort of the largest companies have the most diverse, at least in gender diversity boards. And there may be a couple of explanations for that. Uh, one, that they are uh, able to devote the resources to identifying and compensating uh, good women board candidates. Uh, perhaps as John suggested, they're more in the public eye uh, shareholders are looking at them and scrutinizing their board, perhaps more than smaller companies. And so it is more of an issue for their constituencies that they want to attend to. Um, and, um, or perhaps it is that they've been more successful because they have diverse boards. So we don't necessarily know the causation there. In looking at, um, let me get to the next, whoops. Now I'm having the slide problem too. Okay, here we go percentage of BIPOC board members or Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, this is a much harder number to get at. It's pretty easy to look at a corporate proxy statement and determine who's female. And often they'll talk about Ms. Broom or Mr. Conley, and you can judge that way even if there is an ambiguous first name. But um, for people of color, it is much more difficult to determine uh, and, and much less measured. Uh, and again, that is something that, you know, your project ought to think about with respect to looking at diversity on medical boards. 
Um, but again, you can see the uh, pattern is still consistent for when we have been able to measure uh, this diversity that the larger companies have greater diversity than the smaller companies. And then that uh, bottom line is um, you know, women of color and they are really particularly disadvantaged with respect to uh, the diversity numbers. So let me uh, talk now about some corporate board diversity focuses and approaches and again, we heard this morning the recommendation that Elizabeth made that we uh, get uh, geographic, racial, ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity of the state. The board ought to, the medical board ought to reflect that diversity. Um, like Elizabeth, I'm a little curious about what cultural diversity is, um, but how do you know you have it? So you need to understand uh, what it is you're looking for, what your current uh, numbers are, and then are you, uh, what is your state's uh, breakdown via these various factors that you are saying that are important, and then how does your board compare uh, with, the, with that state breakdown? And the issue came up this morning of how about the LGBTQ plus community, should that be uh, added in to that type of diversity as well? And so I'll tell you how um, corporate uh, diversity has developed over the years. The, the first focus was on gender diversity, um, and that started uh, really in European countries, particularly in Norway, led the way, and they did it with a mandate requiring 40% of the boards of corporations have be women by a certain date, and if not, uh, that the company be delisted from the stock exchange. So in addition to figuring out what is it that you're trying to achieve what is the percentages you're trying to hit, counting to determine have you hit it. The next question is, if you don't, what do you do about it? So what is the consequence? And in Norway, it was a very severe consequence. And lo and behold, with these mandates, uh, which I prefer to the more um, laden term quota, um, there was gender diversity achieved. California passed a statute um, back in 2018 or 2019 mandating gender diversity and then followed it up last year with additional uh, racial and sexual orientation diversity that must be uh, present on boards of directors of California companies by certain time periods or else uh, the or else is a $100,000 fine uh, which goes up over time. So um, you could approach it through a mandate. Um, let's see. There are uh, other approaches that say, let's set a target. And that may be more like uh, the approach that is being proposed for the medical boards. And then if you don't hit the target, uh, comply or explain. You need to, if you don't hit the target, you need to explain why. And one of the large uh, stock exchanges, NASDAQ, recently proposed, uh, and this proposal is before the SEC, that there be targets with respect to uh, female representation um, and um, uh, people of color representation, which could include also LGBTQ plus representation that was included in the California statute as well uh, within a certain time period. Um, already, the corporations have pushed back on that and have said for small boards, where we have five or less, we should really only be required to have one diverse person, not one woman and one person of color or of a, a, but the BIPOC uh, sexual orientation. So I know uh, this morning we heard that some of these boards are small boards of, of five perhaps, or maybe a few more. And so on smaller boards, uh, this kind of diversity is probably going to be more difficult to achieve. Um, some Proposals are, let's just disclose the board diversity th that is there. And that is particularly important, especially with respect to racial and ethnic diversity, which is harder to divine from a written word that describes who the board members are unless the board members self-identify and that is then reported. Um, the SEC a number of years ago said, well, all we're gonna do is ask uh, corporate boards to discuss in their proxy statements where the shareholders vote on board members, whether and how diversity is factoring into the director nomination process. 
Um, and that has had some effect, but maybe not as much as, as people would have hoped. And then on the right hand side, uh, institutional investors, people who are investing for our mutual funds and all of that that we're invested in, uh, insurance companies and others have announced, uh, many of them, investment policies related to board diversity. In other words, that we don't really want to invest in a company unless it has one woman, two women. And their initial focus was on female representation and has just recently within the last year and the increased attention to racial justice issues uh, turn some to uh, racial and ethnic diversity. Um, there is also uh, some self, whoops, some self, get my slides here. Some, I don't know why there's floating around there. Self-interest of other directors in seeking reelection. So there are companies called proxy advisors that advise some of these institutional investors how they should vote their large stockholder positions. And uh, some of those institutional investors are advising to vote against directors who are serving on the nominations committee and are not nominating a diverse slate of directors. There are various groups that are also advocating for greater board diversity, including a group I'm associated with at the law school at UNC called the Director Diversity Initiative uh, that has a database to help put corporations and aspiring diverse directors together and does training for uh, potential diverse directors. So um, I guess from, from some of the work that I've done with respect to the DDI, another thing that we suggest to corporate boards is you need to broaden the view of who would be a good director. If you think it's only a CEO or a retired CEO, you're not gonna find very many women or people of color uh, because they just have not uh, been in those ranks. So identify the skill sets that you think would enhance the board's functioning uh, and look for people that uh, are diverse who could bring those skill sets. Uh, some searches have been successful in adding diversity because they only have diverse candidates in them rather than have a, you know, the token candidate up against uh, the, the white guys. Um, and also, if you're looking to expand diversity on corporate boards, you're going to need to go to different networks with diverse candidates and not rely on the pale, male, and stale folks sitting around the table to find uh, people that they know who would add diversity to the corporate board. So John, let me turn it back to you. You're on mute, John. All right, what can medicine learn from the lawyer discipline experience? Okay, uh, patterns of bar discipline. Uh, there's a lot of qualitative evidence out there about the beliefs of certain kinds of lawyers. This isn't directly uh, race, gender, ethnicity, but it, as we'll see, it has some correlates. Small firm and solo practitioners uh, believe that discipline is disproportionately directed against them. The bar dominated by the big firm elite and they're out to get the little people. Uh, and such evidence as there is suggests they're right. This is an interesting, very recent University of Michigan study of 19 states. 5% of lawyers get a misconduct record at some point. Uh, misconduct record is broadly defined, but wow, that's uh, amazing. And most of those people are repeat offenders. Uh, rates of misconduct are higher among lawyers from lower rank law schools uh, and lawyers who practice in areas with what the study calls vulnerable populations, uh, which overlap with areas with deteriorating economies. So certain kinds of lawyers receive the bulk of the discipline and other data show disproportionate discipline uh, generally against solo and small firm lawyers. So next slide, Lisa. Uh, what about racial effects? Uh, there's a 2019 study by the California Bar. And if you look only at the bottom line numbers uh, and don't try to control things, there was a statistically significant disparity in probation and disbarment along racial lines. And the largest gender or race disparities were the rates between black male attorneys and their white male counterparts. So black men and white men, statistically significant differences. 
Uh, what's going on with these disparities? Well, uh, the obvious thing that comes to mind is that there is bias going on uh, in various ways, gender, racial bias. And that would be bias among both the clients who are making the complaints and the bar authorities who are dealing with the complaints and doling out the discipline. But then if you think about clients, individual clients file far more complaints than corporate clients. And individuals, unlike corporations, are typically represented by small and solo practices. Why do they file more complaints? Well, most people, individuals, rarely use lawyers. Uh, when they do use a lawyer, it's a matter of greater importance to them. Most people, for example, never are involved in litigation. And if they are, it's only once. So when things go wrong in a rare legal representation, it can have a huge impact on their lives. And they need, they are motivated to blame somebody for financial and other reasons. Businesses, they're regular legal customers. Uh, when they're unhappy with their lawyer, unless something egregious has happened, uh, then they just move on to the next lawyer. They don't spend their time uh, with complaints. And then our minority lawyers are more likely to work in the smaller practices that because of the nature of the clientele are more often targeted, exposed to more clients who complain, probably so. So there's probably a secondary racial effect there. What's the bar doing about this? Well, there's a lot of concern across the country about the lack of diversity on disciplinary committees. The people usually by districts within a state who meet out the discipline. The Texas bar last year, disciplinary committees should fairly represent the gender, racial, ethnic, and gender makeup. And this ties into a point Elizabeth made earlier today, gender makeup of the lawyers in the district they serve, including the goal that lawyer members reflect various practice areas and law firms. So this focuses on diversity with reference to lawyers. Uh, underlying assumption here is that diverse disciplinary committees will address client complaints more fairly than committees dominated by white males. There's a secondary objective here, but it's clearly secondary. And that is make aggrieved clients feel more comfortable about asserting complaints and more confident that the outcomes will be just. Next slide, Lisa. Okay, so what might medicine learn? Well, first of all, the focus of the bar seems different from what people have been talking about uh, today and I've been reading in connection with this symposium. The bar's diversity initiatives are focused on a specific and a different problem, protecting lawyers, protecting lawyers from biased and unfair discipline. There is concern about protecting clients, uh, but that tends not to focus on the disciplinary process itself, but on rogue actors uh, and rogue firms, the pathological individual. But even if the diversity on committees uh, is intended to address a different evil, uh, the benefits of diverse boards may translate across the professional boundaries. All right, so we wanted to kind of bring this home here and maybe we can move through these last two slides expeditiously and get us back on track time-wise to uh, go back to the arguments that John presented at the beginning to determine whether these arguments for diverse boards in the corporate board setting would apply in, in the context that um, we are looking at here of medical boards. And I guess, you know, the fairness argument is a big one. And, um, you know, I would posit, what, who do you want the board to represent? The diversity of the physician population within a state, the diversity of the population within a state, uh, assuming that that is a proxy of the patients who the board is trying to protect or who, and I, th I think it is the latter that Elizabeth was suggesting this morning um, in the population of the state as a proxy to the patients in the state. Uh, the business justifications, uh, obviously the medical boards aren't business organizations, 
that they could benefit also from these untapped talent pools of uh, women and people of color who might not previously have been asked to be on these boards. Uh, looking diverse will perhaps uh, alleviate the need for conferences like this in the future uh, because people will say the boards are diverse. That can't be the problem. Signal to patients um, and others, uh, maybe even other doctors. Um, so I think many of the things that we discussed really are um, potentially carry over into this. And I'll, I'll ask John to, to join in with the last word or any additional observations, but I'd bring your attention to the last bullet there about fishing in a bigger pond. So to the, I know uh, you talked about distributional requirements in terms of some physicians, some lay people, but are there others um, who are not physicians who perhaps have the necessary expertise to fill that um, person in the medical profession bucket. Uh, and maybe there is more diversity outside of the physician group, I don't know. But if there were, that might be a place to look and to have a broader view of who can uh, provide good help on these medical boards. And then also think about whether there are implicit age limits in selecting board members that are limiting the pool. So if the physician pool is uh, more diverse at the younger ranks based on historical um, admissions and to medical school and so on, and you are looking for people of a certain level of gravitas, then you may be likely to be artificially limiting the diversity that you could have. Uh, John, any last words on this um, set of slides? Just picked up for a second on gravitas. Uh, to me, uh, my sense is that the medical profession is far more hierarchical and particularly hierarchical in a seniority way uh, than is the law. And I think about, for example, the residency system. I'm assuming, and I've read a fair amount that suggests that that gets translated into disciplinary boards. So a bigger pond uh, might break down the hierarchy some in the disciplinary boards and give you different and I would think better perspectives. All right, I will, uh, that concludes our presentation. Again, thanks Elizabeth for having us. Great, we can move to our last speaker. Great, hello, let me go ahead and share my slides. All right, are you able to see those? Yes. Great. All right. Um, well, let me go ahead. I'm Liz Chiarella. Let me go ahead and get started um, by offering a number of thank yous. I'd like to say thank you to Elizabeth for inviting me to be here. Um, thank you to Rakaya for that very kind introduction. Thank you to the faculty, staff, and students at SLU Health Law for organizing this symposium. Um, and especially thank you to Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues for sharing with us what is a very ambitious and very compelling and I think very important project. Um, I will begin my talk with a confession. I have been fascinated by boards for the last decade, um, but almost no one talks about boards. It's not a very hot topic in, um, in sociology. We don't really talk about it much in sociolegal studies. Um, and so it's wonderful to be here and to be part of a community of scholars who are actually thinking about boards and are interested in um, figuring out how boards might behave differently. Um, boards are really important organizations. They wield a great deal of power, um, but they often don't behave in ways that we might expect. Um, and the public knows so little about boards that they're rarely a topic of conversation. I think if you ask most people, they don't realize that a board exists or they think the board and the association are the same organization. Um, and as part of my own research, I've interviewed board executives, board members, board investigators, expert witnesses, and lawyers who defend professionals in board proceedings, um, which is why I'm, a, I'm enthusiastic to add my voice to what has already been a really engaging discussion. Today, we learned a great deal about how boards operate and the challenges that board members face when trying to discipline physicians. We've also learned a great deal about the legal context surrounding board work and about which resources boards have that work 
and which board, which resources boards feel like they're, they're lacking. But what we haven't yet considered um, are the organizational and cultural contexts in which boards operate and how organizational and cultural dynamics might help us to better understand why boards act the way they do, sometimes in mysterious ways. So I'm going to take this opportunity to zoom out from the board itself to theorize about aspects of the social context that help shape board behavior. Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues ask a critically important question. If medical boards are designed to protect the public from physician harm, why do they so often fail to do so? These researchers cancel out a lot of noise by focusing on egregious harm, um, things like sexual assault, opioid overprescribing, and fraudulent surgeries um, that are behaviors that clearly cause harm to patients and that boards should be highly motivated to address. And yet, boards are ill-equipped to do so. Only 0.1% of physicians each year face disciplinary action um, that involves the most severe forms of punishment. So those are things like license suspension, surrender, and revocation. And as a result, many physicians harm their patients and get off scot-free. There are no consequences. So what these findings indicate is that there's a mismatch between the board's mission to act in the public interest and the board's action, or more accurately, inaction, when it comes to punishing physicians who do harm. If we think about this from a legal perspective, this is really, really su surprising. Why isn't the board doing what it's designed to do? But if we think about this from an organizational and cultural perspective, it's not surprising at all. Boards and the hospitals and clinics that are supposed to report to them are simply behaving like every other organization does in their circumstances. So why aren't boards more effective at protecting patients? Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues find that a lack of resources makes it difficult for boards to protect patients, but other factors matter here too. I propose that to understand boards' behavior, we need to consider three types of barriers, input barriers, processing barriers, and output barriers. And we need to consider how cultural norms and values shape what goes on in organizations. So let's begin with input barriers. One major reason that boards do not discipline physicians who inflict egregious harm is because they never hear about it. Um, hospitals and clinics are legally required to report physician misconduct to boards, and yet many either don't report or they report information that is so vague um, that boards can't even understand what happened, let alone act on it. So the first question is, why don't hospitals and clinics report physicians to boards? Um, and there are likely three main reasons for this. One reason they might not report is that doing so can hurt them reputationally and financially. Keep in mind that organizations like people have a survival instinct. Um, so they avoid doing things that would threaten their survival. Hospitals and clinics rely on public trust to stay in business. Reporting physicians to the board invites negative press coverage and casts administrators in an unflattering spotlight. All of this undermines public trust and it threatens the hospital or clinic's reputation and bottom line. A second reason that hospitals and clinics uh, likely don't report is because there are no consequences for failing to report. What we're seeing is what socio-legal scholars call a gap between the law on the books and the law in action. So um, what they're supposed to do is very clear, but what they're doing is very different from, um, from what's required of them by law. Um, so there's a legal requirement to report and yet very few reports are made. But what explains this gap is the fact that hospitals and clinics face harm when they do report, but they face none when they do not. So given this set of perverse incentives, it's no surprise that hospitals and clinics fail to report or that some skirt the line by giving boards enough information to meet the legal requirement, but not enough to investigate. So they're kind of playing with the boundaries of the law here. Third, organizations in general are inclined to protect their members from consequences, particularly when it comes to sexual offenses. Um, we live in a society in which sexual harassment and sexual assault are rampant, 
and yet perpetrators of sexual offenses rarely face consequences. Only 25% of sexual assaults are reported to the police and only 2% of perpetrators serve any time at all. Organizations protect perpetrators of sexual crimes by engaging in two processes, buffering and circulating. Organizations buffer when they create legalistic structures and organization-specific disciplinary procedures that signal to the outside world that they're addressing the problem when in fact the consequences that result are minimal. So consider, for example, how sexual assault is handled in American universities. Universities are federally required to have Title IX offices, and they typically have student disciplinary proceedings for sexual assault. Students who are assaulted can report to the Title IX office, and they often do instead of going to the, the police. And all of us, you know, faculty, staff, we're all mandatory reporters, so we also have to report to the Title IX office. Um, sexual assault is a crime but universities buffer perpetrators from criminal consequences by sending students through university disciplinary proceedings whose worst punishments, suspension and expulsion, are far less punitive than outcomes like incarceration that can result from legal proceedings. A second strategy that organizations use to protect their members is circulating. Circulating is a process of sending offenders to a different organization instead of punishing them or a different branch of the same organization. Circulating gets rid of the perpetrator, but it also protects the organization's reputation in the process. Um, Catholic parishes famously used this strategy to get rid of priests who were sexually assaulting children doing what was called priest shuffling. Um, but it's also a strategy that's used by universities to get rid of professors who assault students. Um, police departments use this to get rid of officers who harm, who harm citizens. And high schools or sports teams use it to get rid of coaches who assault players. In each case, circulating creates opportunities for more harm. Because instead of being shut out of the church or the um, university or the police department or sports, they simply move their harm to another, um, another organization. So what does all of this mean for hospitals and clinics? It would be reasonable to assume that hospitals and clinics engage in buffering and circulating instead of reporting to the board. That they buffer those physicians with powerful reputations who bring in a great deal of money and that they circulate those who don't. So buffering and circulating help to protect the organization's reputation and its finances, but they never actually address the harm that's occurring. So buffering and circulating might help explain why boards never receive information that they should. But what about the information that they do receive? Why do boards so often fail to discipline physicians even when someone reports them? The answer lies in processing barriers. Several factors are likely to shape how boards process information, including the very factors that prevent them from receiving complaints in the first place. One way of thinking about the board is as a buffering organization, that it buffers physicians against other kinds of, um, of legal entanglements. So a little bit of history is instructive here. Boards are regulatory ag agencies that are born out of professional quests for power. When boards were first developed, the medical profession looked nothing like it did today. Before 1910, physicians did not enjoy a particularly high social status. Um, instead, they were on par with pharmacists and nurses and midwives and chiropractors. And physicians themselves differed significantly in their training and in their techniques. That all changed when the Carnegie Foundation commissioned a team to evaluate the quality of medical schools um, which resulted in the Flexner Report, um, which was published in 1910, that gave allopathic medicine, the kind of modern medicine we know today, an edge over other forms of practice. Still, physicians felt other professionals breathing down their necks, um, poised to do battle over control over medical tasks. So physicians struck a regulatory bargain with the state. The bargain was this. The state would grant physicians sole control over a subset of tasks and give them the autonomy to decide how they practice medicine. Um, in, in exchange, physicians promised to regulate themselves through boards in ways that protected the public interest. This is the model on which boards are predicated today. 
But this model creates tensions between board members' mission to protect the public um, and their professional identities. Board members are required to protect the public by disciplining physicians who inflict egregious harm. Um, and this puts them at odds with physicians who behave badly. However, most board members are physicians. That's part of their professional identity. Um, so they tend to identify with other physicians, even those who cause harm, or they might downplay harm because they, you know, Dr. X would never do something like that because, you know, um, I know Dr. X and Dr. X is a good doctor. Um, so how do physician board members contend with these competing impulses to protect the public and to protect fellow professionals? Evidence suggests that they err on the side of protecting fellow professionals. Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues tell us that very few physicians face the most severe forms of punishment, um, either suspending, surrendering, or revoking a license. What prevents boards from using the strongest weapons at their disposal to stop patient harm? I suggest that there are inter, intra-professional and structural forces at play, and that these result in buffering and circulating at the board. Professionals tend to protect their own much like the so-called blue wall of silence uh, that motivates police officers to protect one another even in light of egregious wrongdoing. Some scholars argue that physicians experience a white wall of silence or a white coat wall of silence that motivates them to protect one another despite evidence of patient harm. In general, determining whether a physician engaged in wrongdoing depends on the standard of care. Um, and the standard of care is a somewhat fluid concept that evaluates whether the physician is behaving in a way that vastly diverges from behavior of other physicians in their specialty. Um, with this in mind, many boards build in physician experts throughout the disciplinary process. So not board members, but other experts who come in and help to make these decisions um, to ensure that the physician is really violating the standard of care. Now, the standard of care is less important in cases of egregious misconduct um, because those acts violate professional ethical and legal standards, even if everyone else is doing them. There's no standard of care that can take care of that. Um, but still, professional expertise often factors into board's choices about pursuing cases. So you pair these structural requirements of including physicians in making board decisions um, with the white wall of silence um, and it's no surprise that board members are so hesitant to pursue the strongest levels of discipline. Consider, for example, the difference between the medical board and the pharmacy board in California. Now, both boards, um, when I was doing research there um, from 2010 to 2015, both the boards were led by consumer advocates. So these weren't, there wasn't a physician, it wasn't a pharmacist. These were people who were trained in public protection. Um, but at the pharmacy board, the executive director and the um, lead investigator were the ones who got to decide whether cases moved forward. And the lead investigator was somebody who came out of law enforcement. So you have a consumer advocate and law enforcement deciding whether or not to pursue cases against physicians. In California, however, um, a physician expert got to decide at each step of the process to, to determine for the investigator whether or not those cases could move forward. Um, so if physicians are inclined to protect one another, then an investigatory structure that requires physician involvement above and beyond the board members may result in buffering physicians from the harshest consequences. A third barrier to physician discipline has to do with outputs. And we've spent some time talking about this today. Um, how do medical boards practices of sharing or withholding information affect outcomes for physicians who perpetrate egregious harm. There are two organizations with whom we might expect boards to share information, medical boards in other states and law enforcement. And as Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues discovered, boards often fail to share information across state lines. The result is that physicians can continue to practice um, in one state, even if they lose their license in another. We can think about boards failure to act as a form of circulating. Like parishes and universities and police departments and sports teams, boards take an out of sight, out of mind approach. As long as the bad actor is not under their purview, the bad actor is not their problem. 
This creates an opportunity for bad physicians to circulate throughout states while harming patients along the way. We would also expect boards to share information with law enforcement. Uh, the egregious acts such as sexual assault, overprescribing opioids, and fraudulent surgeries that warrant license suspension or revocation or surrender are also crimes. So when those cases come to the board's attention, it would be reasonable to expect them to alert organizations responsible for investigating those crimes, such as the local police, the DEA, the Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General, or state fraud units. But boards often don't. Um, and in my own research, I've uncovered quite a bit of tension between boards and agencies that investigate opioid crimes. Both organizations find the other to be an impediment to their own investigations. So board members and executives complain that federal agencies like the DEA take records that they need, refuse to share them, and then sometimes don't give them back until their statute of limitations is up. Meanwhile, criminal investigators complain that boards catch wind of their cases, get overzealous, and then decide to do audits of the targeted physician. Um, and then the physician starts to behave differently and that ruins for them years of undercover work um, and the whole case that they've been building. Mostly though, law enforcement agents were frustrated with medical board inaction. Um, their reasoning was that boards have a lower burden of proof and they can issue an immediate suspension order um, to stop bad doctors from prescribing. So in their opinion, boards are too lenient with physicians. Um, they also accuse boards of piggybacking on criminal investigations instead of using their own resources to prevent patient harm. So basically they say, you know, they wait until we do all the heavy lifting, we do this big criminal case, and then um, they automatically revoke their medical license instead of doing what is a much lower barrier uh, process, which is the board process, um, to get the physician um, out of practice. Uh, the reason that boards don't share information with law enforcement is probably also a result of buffering the ways that physicians are protecting their own. However, it might also be about interpersonal barriers. Um, there's little routine communication between board members and law enforcement. So board members are unlikely to know who to call even if they wanted to report. And as a result, contentious and non-existent relationships between boards and law enforcement might help explain why boards don't share information more readily. We began the symposium by asking why medical boards that have a duty to protect the public so often fail to do so. That is why they fail to use their harshest punishments um, even in the most egregious cases. Dr. McIntosh and her colleagues offer one set of answers that center on absent resources that board members say they need to help them do a better job of disciplining physicians. Their research findings have convinced me that resources matter. But I think that organizational and cultural factors matter too. I've theorized about that three forms of barriers, input, processing, and output, prevent boards from fully disciplining physicians who impose egregious harm. Organizations, organizational tendencies to buffer and circulate their members help explain each of these behaviors each of these barriers. So why hospitals and clinics don't report to boards, why boards don't enact harsher discipline, and why boards don't share information with boards in other state, states and with law enforcement. My framework suggests that beyond providing boards with the resources they need, we also need to disrupt the organizational processes that, that prevent disciplinary cases from moving forward. And we need to change the incentives that hospitals, clinics, and boards face to protect physicians. When organizations buffer and circulate physicians instead of disciplining them, they not only fail to punish past harm, but put, but put future patients in harm's way. And there's no doubt that these maneuvers fail to serve the public interest. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, and if you could stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much. All right, so we have uh, lots of questions in uh, the chat um, as well as a Q&A. So I want to ask to all of the pan panelists, um, countries like Germany have also incorporated 
workers into their boards, as well as through the process of co-determination. How does that fit within your analysis about boards? And maybe if uh, Professor Broom and Colleen want to speak about that first, that would be great. You want to start, Lisa? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. So um, Germany does have a unique structure, or at least different than what we have in the United States with respect to corporate boards. And they have two different types of boards, and one does include employees, which is not the case in the United States, except for the CEO who would sit on the board of directors typically. So if we think about this in the medical board context, it seems to me that you know the physicians who are being regulated by the medical board are well represented on the medical board. So it may be more akin to that uh, German model. John, you got any other? Yeah, thoughts? I was just going to say, I'm not sure the worker representation um, increases diversity if we look at it from that point of view. Uh, in Europe, this grows out of private sector unions. In the US, uh, private sector unions have long been historically part of the problem uh, with lack of diversity at higher levels. So I'm not sure that would promote that goal. All right, does anybody else wanna jump in? Okay. Um, so I think this is uh, more uh, to you, Pro Professor Leva. Is there more fentanyl being prescribed? Uh, I cannot answer that question, but what I can say is that um, these deaths have been attributed to illicit street fentanyl uh, as a general rule. That's the CDC says that explicitly. I caveat any of those statements that I ever make um, with uh, this following disclaimer. We aren't particularly good in death investigations in the United States. Most coroners are not medically trained. They often have small budgets. Um, so talk screens have to be taken with a grain of salt, but it is the CDC's view right now that the, the, the true danger is the illicit uh, street fentanyl. It also makes sense because when you have more and more prohibition of legal substances and there are switching drugs, right? You go to something that's much more potent and much more pow uh, powerful. This happened during alcohol prohibition when you know, Americans went from drinking so a glass of cider in the morning like Ben Franklin did to uh, you know, going to the spirits and cocktails. So this is a sort of consistent pattern. All right, thank you for that. Uh, another question. Do you have thoughts on turn limits for board representation? Another important point for medical board membership and diversity, some states have turn limits and some do not. And the latter person can be on a state medical board for years as long as they are willing to serve. I've seen members on boards for up to 25 years. This can impede diversity. Um, and I will stop there. Well, I'll jump in. in. In the corporate board context, very few corporate boards have term limits, but many people think it would be an excellent idea to impose them. Many nonprofit boards have term limits, um, but the general idea of getting the board refreshed is a good thing and can help increase diversity on the board because you're having to get new people and um, that gives you an opportunity to get a new diverse voice. All right, anybody else want to jump in? Just to say that I agree. I think that's right. Among other things, it forces people to expand the pipeline because they've got to find candidates more often. Right, and so this is another question, I think, for you uh, and Lisa about, um, do you find that demographic diversity is just as important as a diversity of perspectives, right? And this can go to um, feminist and anti-racist perspectives, also to including workers who are not necessarily represented uh, by unions on the board um, to ensure that we are just not um, 
replicating the same ideas, right? And so diversity is not uh, just of, uh, after, as we oftentimes say, we need to diversify medicine by increasing rates of people of color. Um, but to do so, we also have to ensure that they are treating and supporting uh, people of color too. So um, I'll stop there. Yeah, diversity is, you know, what do you mean by diversity? And um, we've been talking about it and the statistics I showed for the corporate boardroom were focused on demographic diversity, uh, gender, race, and ethnicity, but obviously it's diversity of thought and perspective, which is what we're really after. Um, and the color of somebody's skin can be a proxy for a diverse perspective, but maybe not, you know, uh, so you, you do need to be careful about getting somebody who is going to be different than everybody else that's in the room. If, if they're exactly the same, but just a different skin color or a different gender, then you're not getting the uh, increased discussion, new ideas, different perspectives, different lived experiences, which is what this is all about. Um, that if different people are making a decision, they'll come to a better decision than if a group of homogenous people are making a decision, they'll get to it really fast, but it won't necessarily be as good as the one that was messier because it had so many different perspectives. Yeah, one of the things that uh, repeatedly struck me in our interviews was how people struggled to provide examples of how diversity manifested itself uh, in a corporate board environment. Uh, some of the examples people gave were really cringeworthy uh, and involved stereotyping. Well, the woman knows about this or the black person knows about that. Uh, but there, I don't know that there are any good examples of diversity functioning as I think we want it to function where there's a subtle interaction of perspectives that might not have been there but for diversity. So that's a, an interesting, difficult, delicate question to get people to talk about how diversity actually works and what kinds of diverse, measurable diversity uh, really do affect the quality of decision-making. We also did, did our interview study and in, in actually pre-financial crisis and um, the number of women and people of color on boards at that point in time was fairly small. So many of these uh, people ex exhibiting these uh, demographic diverse characteristics could have been characterized as tokens and they were trying really, really hard to fit in um, to the board. Right, and that goes on. If you're talking about true diversity, then it's a better model of cohorts and not just one individual person, right? That if we are really going to talk about diversity, that that's how you support it. All right, so we have a question from Professor Pendo, and this is for you, Professor Leva. If we do not use the, P the PDM P to identify prescribing offenses for the reasons you provided, are there more equitable and reliable sources of information to identify prescribing that harms patients? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, what we need to do here and is a bit more complex, but the EHR itself, right, the electronic health record has a diagnosis, as long as you have the prescribing, there, as long as we have that integrated system and you have something like that, um, that's a better choice because you get a lot more patient information. What I would like to see incorporated uh, into any model it is a, any kind of measurement of patient outcomes. And I, I understand where she's coming from. And I just wanna emphasize this to people again, because it's actually hard to hear it the first time and believe it. It was at least a struggle for me. Maybe I'm, that may be just indicative of my personal failings, but these PDMPs do not measure patient outcomes at all. So a prescriber cannot use the PDMP uh, <clears throat> risk score to see, am I doing better? Did the patient end up going to the ER? Did the patient improve when I changed the medication regimen? It's because the PDMP was not created to measure patient outcomes. The PDMP was created to track and surveil from a law enforcement perspective, prescribers and um, patients to eliminate this sort of 
quotes unquote doctor shopping, pill mills, and these sorts of things. So that that kind of stuff was simply just not included uh, in the model for a PBMP. And, and I think we need to take a hard look at that. All right, thank you. For Dr. Chiarello, do you know of instances where uh, legal or policy tools were used to encourage reporting of bad behavior and diminish buffering and circulating? For example, public reporting or fines? It's a great question and no, nothing is coming to mind immediately. I, I mentioned earlier that organizations are interested in protecting themselves. They really care about survival. And so one of the things they do is what's called symbolic compliance. So, you know, they're required to do something and then they do it, but they do it in a way that doesn't really create change. So we have this risk with diversity too. You know, you could be required to have women and people of color on your board and you can have one woman and one person of color or one woman of color and then call it a day even though the other 19 people on your board are um are white men um of the same age and so i think that's that's one of the challenges is like is that you actually have to be able to get into the organization and get into how the organization is functioning it's not enough just to create a law or create a policy you actually have to get into these mechanisms and it's interesting because i think my work and jen's work um side by side shows you know we're very bad at dealing with sexual assault and sexual harassment, but we are overzealous when it comes to over prescribing. And so we can't create one set of rules like everyone has to report or you pay a fine um, because otherwise we're going to, we're going to harm patients by hurting doctors who over prescribe. Um, even though we might get patients who have, uh, we might get more physicians who have assaulted patients. So I think there are a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of intricacies that have to be dealt with at the organizational level, um, if we're gonna try to get them to do what we're asking them to do. Okay, thank you. I wanna thank all of the panelists for um, participating. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Elizabeth Pindo. Okay, um, I just want, oh, could all of our panelists who are still with us um, turn your video on so we can all see you again? Thank you. Uh, I would just really like to echo all of the thanks that we've heard um, throughout the day, starting with Sydney Watson and through all of our speakers. Special thank you to everyone who was involved in planning this day, Amy and Cheryl and Julie. Uh, I want to thank my health law colleagues for supporting me in this project and for helping me host this event today. I really appreciate it to my student research team who's been out mapping these laws and was present all day today listening and learning from our speakers. Um, of course, to my team members at WashU, Jim and Tristan and Heidi and Carrie to our wonderful advisory board who has helped us all along the process. And you know, really a special thank you to the panelists who took part in our surveys. At the time we created this project and um, recruited panelists, it was in the before times, before COVID. And you know, you haven't uh, experienced fun until you've tried to do a survey of primarily physicians during a major pandemic. Um, but despite some delays and obviously having demands on their time due to COVID, we really appreciate the incredible participation and rate of part participation um, that they gave us. I special thank you to all of our speakers today. Just a round of applause for all of you for sharing your expertise and your feedback. Um, and to the students at the Journal of Health Law and Policy who are gonna be publishing papers um, from today in a special issue. And for Everyone who attended um, today, it was incredibly engaging. We appreciated your feedback and your questions. My email is right here. If you have more thoughts or questions or comments or criticisms that you'd like to share with us, please feel free to get in contact with me. We're truly interested in your thoughts as we develop the um, legal paper with the model provisions and also our uh, other publications. 
And then of course, as we move forward to think about strategies to work with boards and the FSMB and legislatures and other policymakers who want to take a look at their laws and policies and practices uh, to implement some of those recommendations to help them better protect patients. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our speakers. And that's it. Amy, do you have a closing word or? Nope. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Thank you. didn't mean to put you on the spot. Thank you all for being here. There's um, a link to an upcoming event that the center will be hosting on March 22nd. So please check that out and register and we'll see you at the next annual Health Law Symposium. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.